My friend and I worked construction, and one night we were enjoying a break, just hanging out together. We had another friend with us, we'll call her Jen. My other construction friend we'll call Maggie. So Maggie and I were talking about some of the strange things that we've seen in houses. And Jen goes, hang on, my mom has the craziest story, let me call her. So Jen calls her mom, and her mom begins to tell us this story of what keeps happening in her attic. Her mom goes, it's the darndest thing, but you know the light cord, the thing you pull to turn it on and off? It keeps tying itself into a knot with a circle hanging down from it. Never have been able to figure that out. As we're listening to the story, Maggie and I look at each other, and our eyes say everything. We're both thinking about the same project that we worked on not that long ago, maybe a couple years. Hey, whereabouts is your house? Maggie asks. Jen's mom tells us, and we about freaked out. After Jen hung up the phone, she asks us what we're freaking out about. I finally got the words together to say, your mom's house was a construction site we worked on not long before you guys moved in. It needed some work after the previous owner left, I suppose. The thing is, she unalived herself in the attic by hanging herself from the light cord, using it as a noose. That was one of the strangest things we'd ever encountered. However, I was working on a site one time that was a full-on demo. It was this old, decrepit mansion in Maine. Well, as we're working, we found this old, dusty VHS tape in the wall. Obviously, we were curious, so we put it into a barely functioning VHS player to see what was on it. All it contained was several minutes of an old woman sitting in a chair in the middle of the basement, staring directly into the camera and breathing heavily. And then it cut off. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now since I was the only one in the cabin I decided to lock the door to my room, just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, what's wrong, did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. 
I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember, though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted. Like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing, even today. It haunts my dreams, and I'm in no rush to see it again. This is not necessarily super creepy, but creepy enough in a sense that it gave me some peace, and I think maybe my grandma some peace too. It was around Christmas time. I was staying with my then boyfriend, and I was staying over at his house, sleeping down in the basement. That night, I had a really strange dream. I was in a house, and there was a party going on. When I was there, an older man approached me. He knew my name, and I felt like I knew him. But I also knew that I had never met him in person, and I couldn't place him. He was really sweet, very nice, and we just kind of stared at each other. It was like we were having a conversation, but we weren't. It was kind of strange. I felt so comfortable with him as a person does with a close family member. Finally, he said, Hey, tell your Nana I say hi, and I love her. And I was like, Oh, okay, sure. And then I woke up. I told my grandma about it the next day, and gave her some information on what the guy looked like. She started crying on the phone, saying, You just saw my dad. I guess he had died a few years before I was born, and I'm actually named after him partially. My middle name is Joe. Turns out his birthday was on December 31st. I believe he would have been 90-something, and the dream that I had was also on December 31st. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the Park Service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the Park Service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. 
For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10 plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around seven o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around five. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here, and I'm still at least two miles from civilization, 
and that civilization in reality was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough though, I heard music, more specifically a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life, no birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush, absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place. Unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue, the music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone, the gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another park service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place a lot more to the Olympics in general than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. For the first time in my life, I had a really lucid dream. At least, I hope that's what it was. I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, my time, PST. At my back door, it's a security door, so like a metal screen door, I saw something and I thought it was my wife. I asked her why she was out there, and she said that she had accidentally locked herself out. I had been out there not five minutes before, and I knew that I didn't lock the door. She was wearing her normal bedtime apparel, but her hair wasn't the right color. And her voice wasn't quite right. I asked again what she was doing, and she just says, Just let me in. I get closer to the door, but I can't see her face. I say again, Why are you out there? She ignores me again and says, Just let me in. I moved to open the door, and I noticed that she changed to an inhumanly small frame, which was all black and had no features. I slammed the wood door and bolted, 
to find my wife asleep in the bed where I had left her. Now, if I'm honest, I don't even believe I was dreaming, but my mind cannot comprehend that as being real. Nothing anywhere near that level of paranormal has ever happened to me before. And whether or not it was a dream, it was definitely freaky. And I'm still trying to figure it out. A while back, the night before the last full moon, I went outside past midnight. It was pretty dead quiet outside, especially since it was during a big cold snap. I was out for fresh air when I heard the sound of chains and ice crackling in the near distance. I got a creepy vibe, but I tried to ignore it. There were no cars or people out that I could hear or see. Suddenly, I heard and saw my backyard gate creak open. I felt this intense presence as I heard footsteps quickly approach me. I ran inside and closed the door before it got to me. I couldn't see anything, but I did get a picture in my mind of a being with antlers or horns or something, not clear enough to say for sure but it felt like it was speaking to me telepathically. I could tell that it read heavy energies, and it told me, don't carry their burdens, and that my heart was lighter than I believed, to keep it pure and I'd have nothing to worry about. I asked it about how to heal or let go of these pains and frustrations that I'd been having with trying to move on and let go of an ex-toxic friend. They told me that they didn't do that kind of work, and left. I got the feeling that they did heavier work. It didn't seem to have any harmful intent. There was a wisdom to it, but not something or someone that I would want to cross paths with if I were up to no good. I live in central Canada, if that helps, the prairies. I can't seem to find anything specific online about any deities or entities that match. There's Krampus, but I feel like I highly doubt that that was it. It was way past Christmas, and I don't think it's tied to Canada at all either. The words mentioning my heart being lighter than I believed made me think of Anubis, but I still don't think that it was Anubis either. I'm not really sure what I encountered that night, but it was really fascinating. Just this weekend, my cousins from the city in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, visited me and my family down here in southern Pennsylvania, near Maryland. We live in the boondocks, and there are many trails for people who enjoy horseback riding and taking rides on ATVs. When my cousins got to my house, we decided to go exploring toward my neighbor's house, who lives in the middle of the woods, isolated in a log cabin. We walked a trail the whole way up there for about a mile, joking along the way. Let me give you a little backstory about the place. Back in the 1800s, there was a bar and a few small cabins for people to stay in. A group of men got drunk one night and attempted to shoot bottles off of each other's heads. People died and the wives of the men who had died burned down the bar and the cabins then were later hanged by the bar owners. This happened right below where we were exploring. Legend says that the women and the people who died in the fires still lurk around the forest. Another incident took place in the 80s or 90s. A teen was driving really fast with his friend at that exact same location as where the bar incident took place. The teen crashed into a tree, beheading his friend believing him alive. The teen was tried for manslaughter as he was driving drunk. 
this place is destined for bad luck. So we're exploring on this trail, approaching the house. As we approached, we heard a very distant whistle, but we thought nothing of it, as it is spring and it was warm on this day, so there were birds around. But when we stopped to take a break, we heard twigs snap. We all froze as a giant branch fell, and then the tree. It was a dead tree that was easy to push down. I looked behind and saw a human figure as it set in with my brain, I realized that it was a man in ripped, ragged overalls that had no more color and a worn out, colorless plaid flannel. He looked no older than 40. He looked at us for a while and then ran at us with a bat-like stick while laughing like a maniac. We ran the other way until we got cut off by an electrical fence. Then we turned the other way. By this time, we were way off trail and in the middle of the woods, but I knew that all I had to do was go down to get back on trail. By the time we got the trail, we lost him. He looked real enough to us, but whether he was a spirit or a real person, we're never going back up there again. My boyfriend and I went to visit family in New York, and we stayed at the Hyatt Grand Central. I believe that there's a paranormal world due to having experiences in my childhood home. I also know that Grand Central Station is known to be haunted. Our hotel was connected to the station, but I didn't think anything of it. Of course, ghosts can't travel from building to building, or so I thought. It was our last night, and I was asleep. I woke up to the sound of the hotel doorknob moving, as if somebody was trying to come in, but I never heard the door open. I closed my eyes and said to myself, you're just imagining things. I heard it again, and I looked up. When you walk into this room, there's this long walkway, and the bed is to the right. I looked up and I swear to Jesus and all of his disciples that I saw a man, a tall figure with black eyes, peek around the corner. I screamed, somebody's in here. As soon as I screamed, he disappeared and I heard the doorknob again, as if he had walked out. My boyfriend jumps out of bed butt naked and runs around the room. The door was locked, so I don't believe it was an actual person because hotel doors are heavy and you can usually hear when somebody opens and closes them. Of course, you can't lock the door behind yourself. I only heard the doorknob move, but never heard the door, so we figured it was a spirit. I later found out that there are tunnels from the hotel to the train station and many people have died in the tunnels. Beautiful hotel, but I will not be returning. My boyfriend and I absolutely adore hiking and there are many places to go because we live in Oregon. Anyway, we decided to go hiking after 11 p.m. at night to one of the most used trails in our area. We had both been there multiple times throughout our lives, and neither of us were concerned about something happening. There was only one thing that we were kind of nervous about, and that was the wildfire that had just happened. We parked on the side of the road and walked to the start of the trail. Even though there was a fire path, it was actually very clean and stable. We started walking up the trail when we started talking about paranormal things. I know it was probably a terrible move on our side to talk about that sort of thing at night in the middle of the forest, but anyway. Now it is to be noted that we both had flashlights, very good ones, 
and we were both being very observant as to where we were on the path. As we got deeper into the conversation, we both realized in just a second that we weren't on a trail anymore, or anywhere near one. I mean, it was like in a blink of an eye. All of a sudden, I remember walking on the trail, and then we just weren't. I freaked out and told him that we needed to start backtracking. But thankfully, he said no, because we couldn't see any trail around us or anything that we recognized. I truly believe if we had tried to backtrack, I wouldn't be here telling you this story. He told me that we needed to start walking up the hill in hopes of either standing on a ledge to see where we were or to find another path. We walked for a while up the hill when thankfully we popped out on a fire road. We walked all the way down, terrified, and came out on the road about a mile from where our car was. It was a really strange experience, and I don't really have any explanation. I just know in my gut that it's a really good thing we didn't turn around. This past Halloween, my fiancé and I went to explore a real haunted building. I honestly wasn't expecting to have any weird experiences, and I went in being skeptical. We booked ahead of time, and I think it was a group of about 20 people or so that we didn't know. They gave us the history of the place and the rules, and said to go look around. It wasn't a guided tour at all, it was just kind of a do-your-own thing. The place was super creepy, and I felt like I got weird vibes because of that. However, we went to the second floor, and I was walking past this tiny room that they probably used to store medication. I went to walk into the room, and the mirror in there was broken. I got really lightheaded, and an instant headache when I looked at it. I felt almost like I wasn't myself for about 30 seconds and I walked into another room. As soon as I left, the feelings went away. About five minutes later, my fiancé said that she had the same thing happen to her, before I even told her what happened to me. We ended up standing in a hallway, and I was just recording with my phone. I'd say maybe 15 minutes went by, with nothing. And then I felt this electricity from my feet course through my body to my hands, and it was like an unseen force went to push my phone away. I wish I could have captured an EVP or some video, but I didn't. Has anyone else checked out a haunted place like this and have any experiences? It's definitely one that's going to be on the books for me for a long time. So, I'm a pretty skeptical person when it comes to the paranormal, albeit having a vested interest in the tales and evidence. I'm the kind of person who browses ghost hunter videos on YouTube and stories on Reddit. I've also visited plenty of purportedly haunted locations in the US, including but not limited to places like the Omni Parker House, the Molly Brown House, the Whaley House, Alcatraz at Night, the Winchester house more than once, and none of them have yielded any sort of evidence. A part of me wants to believe, but is also terrified at the prospect of witnessing something. I was mostly a non-believer, up until a couple of months ago. In short, I had wanted to plan a surprise party and get away for my girlfriend's 30th birthday. She had mentioned wanting to hit the slopes, it was January, so it was still winter time at this point. I organized this months ahead and had invited some of her closest friends to join. I ended up renting an Airbnb cabin that had enough rooms to house 10 people, or five couples. One entire lower floor basement level with two beds, a room on the first floor, and three rooms upstairs. 
also adding that this cabin was in a beautiful rural neighborhood in Tahoe, California, with tons of cabins next door, down the street, adjacent, etc. So there's plenty of housing around us. Nothing peculiar about it. And there are other people staying around. Of course, my girlfriend and I take the master bedroom upstairs, and right across the hall is another couple in one room, and my girlfriend's cousin by herself in the third room next door. All rooms are taken, and the middle floor is a lively area with games, a fireplace, and a foosball table. These details are somewhat relevant and important later in the story. The first night was a night of merry drinking and games. To celebrate the occasion, we had decorated the living area and blown up balloons to be loosely strewn about the large and cozy living room and the family room where we imbibed. It was almost uneventful with respect to weird happenings, except toward the end of the night, balloons would randomly pop at odd intervals. Someone in our group suggested that it was the balloons getting attracted toward the heater vents and popping. I was dismissive of this because not all of them that popped were congregated near vents. I just took note. I didn't want to argue or suggest anything weird at this point. After we all retired for the night and all the lights were off, we could hear balloons popping downstairs at random intervals that reverberated through the silent house. This happened between 2 and 3.30 in the morning. The next morning, there were still plenty of healthy balloons strewn about. Fast forward to night two. After we return from snow activities, we prep for drinking and the usual. After a full day's worth of shredding the snow, we're all collectively tired a bit earlier than the previous night, and we decide to retire around 11.30 to midnight. Here's where I personally experienced things that got me feeling irked. Since it was cold, I decided to go downstairs to turn on the thermostat or heater. Our couple friends across the hall had their door slightly open ajar, the lights were on, and the bathroom was in use. As I'm going downstairs in the dark stairwell, I hear the floorboards behind me creak. I figure it was my friend coming out to follow me for a cup of water or to go to the kitchen. As I walk across the living room and stop at the thermostat, the lights are still off at this point and the creaks continue. And then I hear it stop a few feet behind me near the kitchen. The kitchen lights don't turn on and I hear nothing else. Feeling like he was waiting behind me and I was being watched, I said, What's up, dude? Need something? I turn around and nobody is there. I've only ever read about this dreadful feeling of being watched, and it is indeed every bit as dreadful upon realization in person. A minute ago, I swore someone followed me down. I was taken aback, and my skeptical self once again took note and spoke nothing of it. I went back upstairs. About 30 minutes pass, and it's still cold. At this point, everyone is asleep and I decide to turn up the thermostat a couple of notches. Nothing crazy. I turn on the upstairs hallway light bright enough to light the steps and see from downstairs. I proceeded to head downstairs and stop once again at the thermostat. No floorboard creaks except for my own this time. As I'm turning up the thermostat and thinking to myself how odd that creaking was the first time, a noise broke my train of thought. I hear the ball from the foosball table, several feet away near the fireplace, audibly roll across its surface and hit one of the side walls. Nobody is around, and I am certainly too far away to touch it. I froze in fear and hastily went back upstairs. Somehow I went back to sleep, not even knowing how to mentally process the increasingly evident occurrences. I eventually fall asleep under the pretense that nothing is definitive enough for me to be conclusively sure that this cabin is haunted. I don't mention or wake anyone up about my experiences. The next morning as we leave and drive back home, the balloons were brought up by my girlfriend's friend and couple who stayed across the hall. 
I took this as an opening to talk about my experiences and I disclosed them. At this point, my girlfriend's friend goes pale, gets really serious, and tells us that the previous night she was still wide awake when she noticed a dark figure standing at the foot of her bed. She states that she went into panic mode after blinking and realizing that it wasn't a dream or a hallucination. She shook her boyfriend awake, the guy that I thought had followed me down the stairs earlier that night, only to have it disappear when he woke up. This, by far, coupled with my experiences, is undeniable evidence. I myself was wide-eyed upon hearing this solid piece of information. My girlfriend's cousin, who stayed in the room next to us, then mentions that she heard what sounded like breathing in her room, but dismissed it as naturally occurring sounds of the walls of the cabin. These events stand alone could be nominal and may be explained, but collectively, it's really hard to deny that something was present and amiss. I'm hoping that this is the extent of my run-ins with the paranormal, because I don't want to experience anything like this again. The universe has made this skeptic more of a believer. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. That feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like, Pics or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2. Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools, but when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, 
probably ten screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken, but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. About three years ago, my friend who I had known since birth was diagnosed with leukemia. After an intense and scary year-long battle, the cancer won. I miss him so much that I'm tearing up just writing this. Something happened before he died, though, that was really weird. I was eating some food in my dream, and my friend rang the doorbell. He had all of his hair, and he looked happy and healthy. He looked at me and said, I had a life I was going to live, and I couldn't live it. I want you to live a life and enjoy it. He smiled a bit and shrugged and said, Hey, it'll be okay without me. I'll miss you too up there. But don't worry about me. The pain is gone. He went in for a hug, and we hugged for what felt like an eternity. I love you, man, he said, as his parents' car door opened. I yelled, Mark, don't leave me. Live. You have to live. He just looked at me and said, Sorry, man, I gotta go, and kind of laughed. I screamed and screamed, don't leave me, over and over. But he got in the car, drove down the street, into a bright blue light, his favorite color. The second that the car was engulfed, I woke up crying and screaming. This all happened just as my mom got home. She walked in as I was crying, and she said, Mark died. And I just kept crying and said, I know, I know. I cried for the whole day, but it did feel better being able to say goodbye in some way. I really do miss him. Rest in peace, Mark. I'm going to preface this by saying that it isn't my story, but something that happened to my parents. They live in western New York, upstate, and they're very open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens, for reasons other than this encounter. That's a story for another day, though. It might be a good time to add that my parents do not use substances or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory cognizance and intuition goes. I'm just going to copy and paste the text message that my mom sent me about this experience. I thought somebody would find it interesting, or maybe even have an explanation for them. This is what my mom had to say. Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a UFO, or something, between Randolph and Steenberg. There was a huge, very bright light blinking off and on in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except that it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that's not a falling star. I even thought it might be a plane, but it was too bright and too fast and it was plummeting downward with intention. Then, all of a sudden, mid-sky, it was just gone. I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or the trees. Right then, I said, did you see that? And at the same time, Dad said, what the heck was that? He said that he was thinking the same thing I was. And at the same time, we both noticed out loud there are no mountains. And there weren't. No mountains, no hills, no trees. It was just cornfields and open space. 
and this thing just blinked out of existence. The next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky, and it shot directly upward, back into the sky. I was looking out of my rear view, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around, but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad turned around watching it, and it started to follow us. We had that same eerie feeling that we did when we saw that thing that we thought was Bigfoot. All we kept saying was, what the heck is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. Isn't that weird? In this story, user Mischievous Dagger tells about the haunted house they lived in when they were growing up. Growing up, I always had to move from one place to another. There was this apartment in particular that terrified me. I was about seven or eight when weird stuff started happening. Basically, things would go missing, things got moved, I would hear footsteps in the hallways. Once, my dad heard somebody or something small running. He thought it was my sister and called her, but nobody answered. When he came to check on me and my sister, he found us both fast asleep. We always shared a room. One time, my mom baked a cake at night. I don't know why she decided to bake it at night, but she did. At night, we heard muffled chewing sounds. It wasn't my parents, as they had gone to sleep hours before that. Their room was in front of mine, and I would have seen them coming out. The next day, we found half of the cake gone. Another time, my dad bought a GPS. He was very happy with it and put it on the table. The next day, it was gone. My sister and I didn't touch it because my dad was very strict, and we used to be scared of what would happen if we touched his things. My mom was home all day, but she's a busy woman and couldn't have cared less about a GPS. It was gone for a week. Then one day, my dad called my mom asking her where she'd found it. It was right where he had left it, and my mom had never touched it. This freaks me out the most, though. I had a saint. A paper with a saint on it. We call it a saint here. No matter how many times I got rid of the saint, it always came back. I ripped it apart so many times. I shredded it, but it always returned whole to my desk. I no longer live in that house, but every time I walk by it, I get this feeling of dread. This took place in Poland, probably in January. It happened about six months ago. I just had a chat with my friend and I recalled the memory. During winter, I used to go on these short hikes to my local forest. Most of the time, nothing out of the ordinary happened. The most unusual thing was seeing a wolf pack once and that's it. But this event happened at about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. The weather was quite cold, about negative 10 degrees Celsius, and snow was lightly falling. There were no people out that day. One hour into the woods, I heard it. This weird music, which seemed to come from all directions at once, and it kept getting louder. It sounded like muffled piano, and something resembling jingles could be heard too. It went on for a solid minute, and then slowly faded away. I was so weirded out that I didn't even take my phone out at first, but when I finally did, I realized that my phone had turned off, probably because of the temperature. After the music stopped, I decided to finish my hike anyway, as I found it more in the category of weird than frightening. The other strange thing, though, is that when I go out hiking, I always see deer, wild boars, hares, and other animals. There was not a single living being to be seen after I saw the music. 
What could it have been? I am a 23-year-old female, and my husband is a 23-year-old male. And recently we moved in with some roommates. They are James, male 26, Danielle, female 25, and their young daughter, Sarah. We went from living in a decent sized city to living in the middle of nowhere, about an hour away. For context, we live in the south of the US, so it's rural, woodsy nowhere. We're really good friends with our roommates and husband and I knew beforehand that they had both experienced some paranormal goings on before we made the decision to move in. To be honest, I think husband and I forgot all about the paranormal stuff just before we moved. Everything was great when we were settling. We all got along really well, and it was so amazing to be in a place where we had our own space and were on equal ground with our roomies. Then one night, about a month later, husband, James, and I are all lounging in the living room area. Sarah was asleep in her room as it was late. We're talking about the paranormal. Around 11.30 p.m., James has to go pick up Danielle from work. She works the late shift about a half an hour away from us. As James is getting ready to leave, he mentions skinwalkers. Now, husband and I don't use this word. For those of you who don't know, speaking aloud the word skinwalker or wendigo is sometimes believed to attract these deadly creatures to you. Husband and I had strange and horrifying experiences at the last place we lived after one of us made the mistake of saying it aloud. So we don't say it anymore. Our code word for it is flush pedestrian if you're curious. As soon as James said it, I gasped. He laughed it off, but right before he left, he noticed something through the blinds on the back door of the house. He mentioned that he thought there was somebody in the backyard. In truth, we don't really have a backyard. The back of the house is right up against the edge of the woods, but we just call it the backyard. Husband and I, thinking that he's messing with us, laugh it off. Quickly, though, we can see from James's face that he is not. We rush to look through the blinds, and sure as heck, there's something in the trees. It was incredibly hard to see, but it was a very, very tall and thin figure, darting quickly between the trees. It kept itself completely shrouded in the black shadows, and we couldn't make out any other features. James rushes outside, thinking that it's somebody on the property. Husband and I follow, not wanting him to be alone. I stay on the porch while husband rushes down the steps to follow James as he goes behind the house. The second he leaves my eyesight, James immediately turns around and shakes his head at husband. He tells us that as soon as he got to the edge of the trees, he heard a low voice saying, turn around. I come from a pagan background. My mother is Wiccan, and my husband is also pagan. As James leaves, the husband and I finish our cigarettes. I immediately set out to bless the entire house with sacred oils and blessed salts. I had already done this as soon as we had unpacked the last of our things, but I felt it necessary to do again. I went so far as to bless the entire porch as well. As husband and I are doing this, James texts me that he doesn't feel safe and that something isn't right. When I ask him what he means, he writes that just a few miles up the road, a naked man came charging out of the woods and stopped at the edge of the road. When he locked eyes with James, he simply pointed at the car and kept doing so until he was no longer visible in the rearview mirror. We tried to rationalize that it could be one of many non-paranormal scenarios. We thought it might be a prank, but that didn't quite make sense. It was the beginning of a very cold winter, and it was only about 20 degrees out. 
It would have been a lot of effort and discomfort for this man to pull a prank like this on passing drivers. Then we wondered if the man needed help or was possibly in danger. But James was sure that this man did not look at all like he was in distress. If he was, the man would have yelled or tried flagging down the car instead of just pointing at it. The conclusion we came to, for the time being, was that he was most likely on some substances. We don't live in the safest of places, and hard substances are very common around here. Then James texted that he had picked up Danielle, and more weird things were happening. I asked him to elaborate, but he said that he would explain it all when they both got home. As their car pulled up in the driveway, husband and I went outside to meet them, but the two of them quickly got out of the car and rushed toward the house, telling us that we all needed to get inside immediately. When inside, James explained that right before he got to Danielle's place of work, he saw something in a cow field that he can't explain. It was tall, taller than any human could possibly be, and much taller than the thing that we had already seen behind the house. From what he could tell in the dark, it was gray, and it was running, running faster than he was driving at 60 miles per hour, on all fours. And then it ran into the woods out of sight. When he was driving back with Danielle, before James could explain everything that had already happened, she got a sinking feeling in her gut and made James lock all the car doors. A literal second after James complied, the same creature he had just seen was once again sprinting alongside the car. It was much closer to the road than it had just been minutes before, but it dashed again into the trees before they could get a really good look at it. We were all a bit shaken. It was now close to 1 a.m. and none of us could explain anything that had already happened. We tried to brush it all off and we probably could have if it was just one thing that had transpired instead of several. We made the awful decision to go back outside for a smoke. The kind of decision that only idiots in horror movies would make, I know. And that's when things got really weird. Off to our right, there's a small strip of woods that separates our property from our landlord's property, where he lives with his daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughters. In those trees, we notice three sets of eyes. They're glowing yellow-green, and they're just staring at us. Husband asks James if it could be deer, as we do tend to see a lot of those around, but we all knew that whatever those eyes belonged to were far taller than deer could be. Then, to our left, there's more, you guessed it, woods. From that direction, in the pitch dark, I swear I heard a little girl laugh. It wasn't boisterous or loud, more like the snicker that a child makes when they're trying to suppress their laughter. Danielle and husband didn't hear it, but James did. Now we're looking at the big tree to our left that stands just before the edge of the woods, and notice that there's this big black mass behind it, as though something was crouched next to the tree. We all try to rationalize that it's just a big bundle of leaves, but I don't think any of us really believed that. James and husband both dart back inside for a moment, and when they come back out, James is holding a hatchet, and husband is holding his crossbow. Without saying anything to Danielle or I, they step off the porch and walk toward our left, where the little girl laughed. Later, they told us that they thought a child was in trouble and they wanted to help. While Danielle and I were on the porch, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, we see something a few yards away. Down the driveway, there's a huge tree in the middle of the property. Out of our peripheral, we swore that we saw something duck from behind the tree. We kept looking at the tree, and yes, there was something poking its head up from behind the trunk, pulling back very quickly as soon as it realized we were staring at it. At this point, Danielle and I wanted to get inside. We're both shivering from fear and cold, and we just wanted this night to be over. But while Danielle and I were in a match of paranormal peekaboo, 
husband and James had their own very weird experience. For context, I have Tourette's syndrome. This means that I say and do things completely out of my control, and some of my verbal tics are just strange sounds. Some of those sounds include blowing raspberries or popping my lips, which are my two most common verbal tics at the moment. As James and husband are inching closer to the trees, they both hear footsteps through the grass and leaves within the trees. Both of them were too frightened to call out to whoever they thought was in there. Then they hear shuffling. The problem is though, they each hear shuffling coming from different directions that the other doesn't hear. James was walking to the left, husband to the right. James hears shuffling coming from the right, but husband doesn't hear it. But husband hears it coming from the left and James doesn't hear it. So they turn toward each other with their weapons drawn. In their confusion, while they're facing each other, they hear someone running in the woods, full on sprinting through the trees, heading directly toward them. And then it just stops. They take a step back and watch to see if anybody comes out of the woods. No one. But then they hear something in the woods. They hear me in the woods right in front of them. They heard both of my verbal tics. But the problem was, I was standing on the porch behind them. Without turning around, husband calls to me and asks if I just had a tick. I told him no. They back away from the woods without taking their eyes off of that spot until they're close enough to sprint into the house, pulling Danielle and I with them. Inside, Danielle and I are able to tell them about the thing behind the tree. And James and husband are able to tell us about how something mimicked my tics to a T. For the rest of the night, we didn't go back outside. We would all, against our better judgment, peek through the blinds out the back door when we passed it. There was still something in the woods every single time that one of us looked. I didn't get any sleep. Come morning time, husband and I checked all the places that we had seen or heard something, and there was no sign of anyone or anything. I asked my mother what she thought it might be. In her opinion, it was likely something related to a mimic spirit, a spirit that warps reality to feed on fear, but not having enough power to really hurt anybody. She said that it couldn't be a skinwalker because there were too many things happening in too many different places all at once. Skinwalkers are solitary and territorial things, so it couldn't have been multiple of them. But just one mimic could do all the things we experienced. We still hear the occasional giggle in the dark, get a bang or a knock at our back door. We still even see the thing behind the big tree in the driveway almost every night. But that night was something else. I've seen some things in my life, but never, never have I gone through about three hours of nonstop activity. I've since burned sage all throughout the house and the entire perimeter of the property, as well as using the rest of my salt and oil around the entire house. Husband and I even did a late night EVP session at all of the spots that things had happened that night, but we didn't get a single response to any of our questions. I don't know for sure if it was a mimic spirit or if I can fully rule out a skinwalker. I don't even really know if the thing was dangerous or not. But one thing's for sure, I will never forget that night. Back in 2004 to 2005, I worked in a group home supporting people experiencing intellectual and developmental disabilities. I mostly worked nights, and since the clients in that home were pretty chill, we were always allowed to sleep a few hours before getting our clients up and ready for the day. I usually slept on the couch, with my shoes on the floor next to the couch, and my cell phone, keys, etc. either on the table in my shoe or next to my shoes. One morning I got up and started getting things ready for the day. 
I had left my phone on the floor in front of the couch. I was a few feet away from the couch, looked over, and I saw a hand reach out from under the couch, grab my cell phone, and start to pull it under the couch. I lunged down and grabbed my phone with one hand. I pulled my phone back toward me, but I felt the resistance of whatever had a hold of my phone, pulling it away from me under the couch. After a moment of tug of war, I pulled my phone from the grasp of the hand and it disappeared back under the couch. I was really freaked out, and even to this day I get chills thinking about or relating this experience. The hand was obviously thin to be able to slide in and out from underneath that couch. From the wrist to the tip of the fingers was maybe three to four inches. The skin on this hand was gray and wrinkled, almost shriveled, and the nails, the fingernails were long, pointed, thick and yellow. I have no idea what it was that tried to take my phone or why it wanted it, but it creeps me out to this day. This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that somebody had left the oven on. Each of us denied having done it, but we knew somebody had to have left it on. Looking back though, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody had even put food in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, movements from the side of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting, but myself and one other were not totally convinced. It was soon after that it was only me left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing some studies, they looked up to see a face peering at them before it vanished. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore that she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would just send shivers down our spines any time we were in there. There was one night in particular that really scared me, though. I always locked my door before going to bed and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself that it was just a dream, and I went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open. So were all of the doors in my wardrobe, and the guys had told me that it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other, all night long. I hadn't moved anything. So many other things happened in that house, but this story has gone on long enough. I decided to tell my story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate, and without saying which house I lived in, he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate that a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior because of the activity. When I told him which number it was, he almost fell off his chair. It was the same house.
My family owns a large piece of land in Missouri. It's near the highlands, but partially on the plains. It includes a lovely little chapel, a one-room schoolhouse, stables, and the plantation home. My family has owned the land for years. I grew up spending school breaks there. It was always enjoyable, regardless of the hard work I had to put in. Every Halloween, my family would do a local hayride and barbecue. It was great fun and everyone loved it. We decorated the entire property. The schoolhouse had all the original desks and materials left in it. So we tried to utilize it the most and the plantation home secondly. It wasn't super structurally sound, so we kept everybody on the first floor. Only family was allowed on the upper floors. Us cousins loved to set up and clean for the big night. The stables were a working area, so we left that to the adults. Nobody went inside the chapel because we wanted to make sure that it stayed in its original good condition. So we'd put up a fake little graveyard and that was about it. The school was abandoned and the house was a walkthrough. When I was 16, I was helping set up the walkthrough. It was cheesy, but fun. I was cleaning the ornate mirrors on the first floor when I heard laughter above me. Figuring it was my cousins, I kept working. I would hear the footsteps of them moving and their laughter for a while. When I got done, I called up that I was going to go help outside. And I heard, All right, see you later. And more laughter. I walked out smiling because I found it cute that they were so immersed in the home. Imagine my confusion then, when I walked into all four cousins at the main house. I asked them how they had beaten me back, and they looked at me like I'd finally lost it. They told me that they'd been working on the chapel graveyard, and they'd been nowhere near the walkthrough. I told them it wasn't nice to try to trick me. We left it at that and continued on for the day. I only realized we weren't alone when I got a call from my youngest cousin, asking why I was running around upstairs in the plantation home. I got deathly quiet. When she asked me again, I could only say, I'm not even on the property. I'm in town. To this day, we've never figured out who exactly lives upstairs. They don't cause harm, but they do enjoy their mischief. Anymore, we keep in constant contact when we're visiting just to be sure we know who we're dealing with, or what. My boyfriend and I stayed at the Hotel Pennsylvania this weekend. It's known for being haunted and it looks like it fits the part. It's old, and the rooms are run down. When we checked in, we got our keys, and went to our room on the 12th floor. The keys didn't work, so we went down and got new ones. Those didn't work either. A worker there had to let us in, and he said he didn't know why our keys wouldn't work, because the key thing on the door was working just fine. Anyway, Last night, I fell asleep at about one, while my boyfriend stayed up for a little bit. He says that at about two o'clock, I sat up, opened my eyes, and looked like I hadn't been sleeping at all. He said all the hair on my body looked like it stood up. And then I said to him, the door is open, and then fell back down and went to sleep. He said five minutes later, the light on the bedside table next to me turned on by itself. He decided to just ignore the situation and go to bed. He got up early at about 6.15 to go to the gym. On his way, he passed a woman in the hallway that he didn't know. He greeted her, and all she said was, The door is closing now. 
and continued walking. I'm wondering if anybody has any information about the Omni Bedford Springs in Pennsylvania. I live very close and I used to go there daily to swim. It flooded when I was a child. In the early 2000s, Omni bought it and restored it, while adding on as well. Construction workers reported many strange occurrences. It was James Buchanan's summer White House. It was a facility to hold foreign diplomats during the wars. The springs are known to have healing properties. I have always felt a presence in the old section of the main hotel. I swam laps there for years in the famous pool. One day, they were filling the pool, and the hose was still. They fill it using the natural spring water from the mountain. About 15 minutes later, it looked as if a child was holding it and playing with it, swinging it around. My friend and I always swam together, and we both saw it. And then, we both saw it suddenly stop. On other occasions, we would hear splashing when nobody was in the pool. One time, I felt a huge movement in the water while swimming. Nobody was there, though. We were the only ones there, and my friend wasn't in the pool. We also spotted a gentleman at the top of the stairs to the balcony, where the band used to play for the pool, but nobody was there when we looked again. I have also sat in the library many times reading while waiting on my friend to arrive, or before I hit the road. I would hear sounds. I'm not sure what the room used to be, but the windows are scratched from brides testing their diamonds, I was told. They also have some of the guest ledgers there. All of the things that happened to me were between 3 in the morning and 6 in the morning. Does anybody have any idea what's going on there? I feel like I should start this story with a content warning first side. About three days ago, I had a pretty weird dream. I dreamt that the mother of my mom's friend committed suicide. I don't remember how, I just remember getting the news from her grandson in the dream. Never met the woman in my life, I only heard about her a few times about a month or two ago. Skip to today, my mom receives a call from the friend, and my stomach just drops. It's like I know that something's wrong, and it is. The woman had hung herself about a half an hour prior. What the heck just happened? Was it all a creepy coincidence? I don't have any emotional connection with that woman at all, nor had I been thinking about her before the dream occurred. My grandmother also had some dream predictions before, but no major events, just some random things. It's really unsettling to me, and I have no idea how to explain it. I wasn't sure where to tell this story, and I probably sound crazy, but this definitely happened. A while ago, I was on the bus back home with my little girl. We had just had a really fun day out. I felt this strong energy and I wanted to investigate, but with my awkwardness, I just kept my head down. Although I kept thinking, what is it about that group of older women that was in the front? And why does it feel like this energy is coming from that direction? This was not just somebody giving off vibes. The feeling was so intense. I'm usually good at reading people, but this just hit different. It wasn't bad either. It felt warm, inviting, 
familiar, and so intense that it made the air around me feel tight, but not in a suffocating way, like a hug from your grandma. I decided to properly look, and this woman caught my attention straight away. Not long after, it was her stop, and I never saw her again. A week ago, on the way home again, I feel this energy again. I look up, and lo and behold, it's the same woman. At this point, the energy was so intense that I nearly got teary-eyed. She started to smile at me when I started feeling that way, but not in a creepy way, just kind of happy. She was sat on the folding down chairs at the front and kept looking down the aisle. I knew she was noticing me, but not making direct eye contact. It felt like she knew that I knew. I know this may sound ridiculous, and it was just based off of a feeling, but it's a feeling I haven't been able to shake. I'm still not entirely sure what happened, if anything. But it was interesting, and I wanted to share. I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but I had never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do there is just to drive around and see the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery we came across, and we found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field, where the stones are not even visible aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet. Another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge. Just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at, and we never experienced anything. We later go to college, and we still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that was known to be haunted, but the location was kept a secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went, and it turns out that they have to list the cemetery in county directories. That's how he found it. Anyway, he tells us that he can take us there, so we go. We went at sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night. We take it very unseriously, but we still wanted to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it was stupid and wildly disrespectful, and we were childish. We asked another question and waited. It was dead silent, and then we hear the leaves crunching, step by step, from the darkness toward us. It sounds like somebody stops right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently frozen. And then we heard the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard. We were in a bit of shock. The whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it, because it was so otherworldly. We slowly began walking, and then eventually running as fast as we could toward the car, without a word between us. I still wonder if what we heard was a big cat or something, but where I live, those are pretty much unheard of. I have never heard anything like that scream to this day. We all still remember it, so I know I didn't make it up, and it gives me chills just thinking about it. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me 
and affected me more than the other experiences. A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend, but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard, while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced, and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch. After those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds, and then a loud bang came, then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door it was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment, I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer. Another cliche thing to say. We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal, except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, the night of the event, there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us because I had been living there for about three years and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with 
was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. But why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving. And it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much. The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. Personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on. So why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt, along with my mother, have had many unexplained experiences, and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now, though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things, too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. So, I should start this by saying, I'm a healthy, sane, 18-year-old male. I've never had hallucinations or been seriously sick in my life. I've also never been known to black out or take micro naps. My mother has schizophrenia, but as far as I know, it was pretty mild, and I've never had any symptoms of it. With all of that out of the way, here's what happened. I was hanging out with my significant other before they went to class at college and before I had to go to work. We parted ways and I got on the bus to go home and get ready. I got on the bus with five other people and I sat in the back as I usually do. So all five were in front of me. I looked down to check my phone when the bus started to move so I could check the route because I'm a nervous person and I wanted to make sure that I was on the right route. I was. I looked up after maybe 30 seconds, and I'm absolutely positive that the bus had not stopped to let anyone off. Somehow though, all five of the people that I had gotten on with were just gone. The only people on the bus were me and the driver. It freaked me out a good bit because the next bus stop was still up ahead. So there's no way the bus had stopped and let people out in the middle of the road. I checked my phone again to get my mind off of it. And then suddenly the bus turned onto a different street, which is weird since the route had no turns. It was a straight line. I'm very much into horror, so my immediate thought was, great, I guess I'm going to hell. 
I signaled that I wanted to get off, though, and the driver let me off without saying anything. I've been thinking about this all day, and I still have no idea what could have happened there. I know it's not as creepy as some stories, but it genuinely freaked me out. When I was about 10 years old, I went with my dad to his farm. I spent my vacations there as a child. I don't have a very good memory of my childhood. I hated school. Everything was so bad that I think I erased almost everything from my mind. But that day is like a video of 24 hours that I have never been able to erase. I got there at night, and as soon as we got there, my mom called. I knew it was because I got some bad grades and almost failed at school. My dad was talking to her, and then he told me to go close the main door. As soon as I got there, I saw a humanoid figure, totally translucent. Only its borders were visible. And behind it, six floating light balls, alternating between blue and red. It was very tall but its proportions were not distorted. It was exactly humanoid, but I could see everything straight through it. The dogs at the farm were surrounding it and barking at it, making angry noises. I was a very scared child, but that thing didn't scare me right away. I got curious instead, so I asked, who are you? And it took a step forward. I immediately started crying and ran back inside, calling my dad, saying there was someone in there. He turned off the phone and without hesitation, went to a wardrobe and took a shotgun hidden between some clothes. When we got outside, it had vanished, but the dogs were still barking and surrounding a certain place in the front of the house, farther away this time, but there was nothing there. It's a plain space with our house in the middle of it. There's nothing surrounding us. After 30 seconds or so, the dog stopped and came back inside like nothing had happened. My dad said that I had just seen an optical illusion of the lights from the bus that brought students that arrived around that time. I don't think so. I still have no clue what that was, and I've never had anything similar happen after that. But I remember that day perfectly and it's going to be about 10 years from the day now, next month. I just had a strange dream the other night, and I can't quite make heads or tails of it. Quick background that pertains to the dream, my dad passed when I was 13 years old, and when I was really struggling with the loss back then, he appeared to me in a dream, keeping this looming darkness at bay and telling me that I would be all right. I later told somebody about that dream, and they told me that sometimes, when a loved one dies, they can come to you in dreams. I didn't believe or disbelieve really, but it felt like a bit of comfort at the time. Now, throughout the years, I've had a dream here or there about my dad, and I always found a little comfort in thinking, hmm, maybe it's him. Fast forward about 16 years to my dream last night. So in the dream, I was in this boggy, swampy looking area. It was dark, but still lit enough that I could see a road. I was on the road and I knew my destination was the grave of an ancestor maybe like a great-grandfather, and all of a sudden my dad shows up in a suburban. I hop in and we're talking when he almost drives it into a soft shoulder or ditch, which my dad wouldn't do while driving because he drove professionally in his life. We continued down the road and we got to this graveyard where I start asking him questions that he can't answer or is answering wrong, stuff that he would know. 
I just got this bad feeling. I just looked at him and said, You're not my dad. He didn't get upset, but he insisted that he was and almost seemed amused. I kept looking for a grave and insisting that he wasn't my father. All the while he kept laughing and saying, Of course I am. This horse appears and starts bucking and rearing and really causing a stir until finally my dad went away. The next thing I know, I'm talking to a woman in a place that was just nothing. Like a place that was just void of everything but her and me. She said something like, when you let your dad in as a kid, you broke open a grate. And in my dream, I had envisioned like a giant sewer grate. She said it allowed all manner of spirits to come and visit as they pleased and to masquerade as my dad. She didn't seem at all concerned or like it was a bad thing, just like she was telling me something that was a fact. At that point, I woke up. The details are obviously a little fuzzy, but I can't stop thinking about it this morning. I just figured I'd see what anyone else had to say. Maybe it was just a weird dream, but it certainly felt like something else. For almost 10 years, a few other people in my family and I have had very extreme paranormal experiences. Most of it is too long to get into now. A lot of it is tied to a house that's demonically possessed and possibly a deceased family member who was quite emotionally disturbed and dabbled way too much in the wrong parts of the occult. But last night, I had a very intense dream. In it, this feminine demonic creature thing was over my grandfather in his sleep. I went to go fight it, and it screamed at me like a banshee. I backed away for a second, right before I woke up. Like I said, this thing felt very feminine, but to describe how it looked is a little bit difficult. It looked almost as though a large, roughly human-sized sheet of leather became sentient and started floating and moving and flying. It didn't have a solid, discernible form exactly either. It literally almost looked like a flying leather monster. It was so black, roughly around where its head might have been, that it was more black than black itself, if that makes any sense. But besides that, like I said, it just sort of looked like a flying leather monster. And then, of course, there was the horrible, threatening scream. I've had other encounters in my sleep with evil paranormal entities at this point, and it's pretty much all connected to that certain house, and possibly that family member. But I'm just wondering what it was. Was it actually a banshee? There's also this wolf that has been stalking around the house for a few months now. It attacked our dog, actually. The house is in Connecticut, but it's in the north, where it's very condensed forest. So it's extremely uncommon, but not unfathomable, that a rogue wolf ended up there. I personally saw a mountain lion there once, and I've seen my fair share of black bears. But I don't know what this thing could have been. I haven't actually lived in the house in question for about four years, other family still does, though. I don't know what's going on, and I've never seen an entity like that thing before. I'm just trying to figure out if anybody might know what it is. My family and I moved to Colorado when I was eight, so around 1997. We lived with my brother and his family for a while until my parents found a more permanent place to settle. We had a few terrifying experiences in this house, 
The short version is that his basement was almost certainly home to something very bad. But these are my stories about some of the experiences in the house that we moved into after leaving my brothers. I will give you as brief a description of the place as I can. My parents found this house almost in the middle of nowhere. Unfortunately, it is now surrounded by new housing developments and stores. But when we first moved in, there were just fields for miles and miles, and we had a gorgeous, jaw-dropping view of the Rockies. The land left adjacent to our property was Rocky Flats, the place where they stored nuclear reactors and who knows what else, underground for years and years. They claim it's all cleaned up now, but we still get dragonflies bigger than my head in spring. And once I even saw a two-headed bull snake in the backyard. Anyway, my parents got a good deal on rent and the landlord was fairly agreeable. To an outsider though, the living arrangements probably seemed strange. Our landlord was basically renting out his basement, but the house functioned like an apartment building. We had our own entrances and our own driveway and garage, but we shared the mailbox and address. The main drive into the top portion of the house was a huge circle that branched off on either side going downhill into our section of drive and house. On your way down, you would pass this little brick building with a glass window and a very old, very visible toilet and a bunch of junk. It read general store on the front. When my parents inquired about this strange setup, the landlord said that the whole property used to be a gas station a long time ago, when the highway that ran in front of the house was the only way into the mountains. Later, the big hill eroded a bit from the weather, and we found an old tank and bucket stuck in the hillside, corroborating the story. The rest of the area was farmland. A steep drop below us behind the house was a horse stable, and beyond that, a pasture, where a farmer would rotate Angus cattle throughout the year. All of this is just to give you a sense of the area. We were literally surrounded by nothing, and sometimes it was a bit terrifying, albeit beautiful. First experience. One of my first nights sleeping in the house, I had a very vivid dream. As a kid, I never really had vivid dreams, so this was something entirely new to me. I remember walking out of my room in my dream and coming directly into the living room. My mother was sitting in her chair staring at the TV, but there was a circle of people standing right in the middle of the room. People I didn't recognize and who didn't register me being there. They were looking at something on the floor in the middle of the circle. When I squeezed past them, I realized they were looking at a woman, lying on the floor, presumably dead. She was wearing a long, mauve-colored Victorian-style dress, and her blonde hair was long and covered her face. I say she was dead because she wasn't moving, and a good chunk of her dress was visibly stained with blood. The most chilling part of this experience, however, was that her body was floating about four to five inches off the floor. When I noticed this detail, I also noticed that the people around her were chanting. As soon as I noted these two things, I woke up. Second experience. This one will forever give me chills when I think about it, and I will never forget it. I don't remember how long we had lived there at this point. I remember it being a normal night. My parents had gone to bed and I was tucking myself in. I don't remember dreaming about anything else that night, and if my memory serves me right, I had fallen asleep instantly and went right into this experience. I'm laying in bed, eyes closed. I can feel my body is asleep, but my mind is awake. I feel eyes on me. I open my eyes and see myself floating above me, staring down at me in bed. Then out of my periphery, I notice another me crouched in the entrance of my walk-in closet, also staring at me. Both of the me's had glowing red eyes. I remember wanting to scream, and when I closed my eyes to do so, I opened them again, and now was on the ceiling staring down into my bed. 
Bed me was still there, but it too had glowing red eyes. Closet me was also still there. They were both staring up at me. I screamed in silence. They began to grin wider than any human should be able to. And then I fell. I woke up in that instance for real, drenched in sweat, still in my bed, feeling like I was going to vomit. I didn't sleep the rest of the night, and I've struggled with terrible insomnia ever since. Third experience. Remember the cattle herd that I mentioned earlier? Well, I'm pretty sure they were mutilated. My dad used to look out our back door with binoculars, just to watch scenery and spy on distant neighbors. One day, I came home from school, and he hands me the binoculars and says, Look at the cow pasture. Tell me what you see. It took me a minute to center on the right area, but once I did, my jaw dropped. The field, which usually housed about 50 head of Black Angus cattle, was completely empty, save for two black lumps on the ground. Ever since we moved there, that field had never been empty. We couldn't see properly that far away. So that night, my dad and I crept down the hill with some flashlights to get a closer look. The two lumps turned out to be two cows, no heads, legs, or tails, and the torsos that were left were completely hollowed out. It wasn't like something had killed them and then snacked on them over time, no. We had coyotes come through all the time. We knew what that looked like. And also, these coyotes avoided these carcasses like the plague. They didn't smell. There was no blood or viscera. And the cuts were surgical. Everything about it made us creeped out. The farmer that owned that chunk of land never came back with the rest of his cattle. And eventually a for sale sign was erected after the bodies had rotted away into nothing. Those are three of the experiences I remember best from that place. Don't get me wrong, it definitely had its beautiful moment scenery-wise, but living on what was previously known as Rocky Flats was definitely weird, to say the least. It all happened during November of 2017. I had just graduated and decided to sign up for the school's annual graduation trip to Johor and Singapore. At the time, my friends and I subscribed to very dumb content on YouTube, such as the 3am challenges. I can't believe I used to think that that was legit. When we arrived at the hotel at 10pm, my friends and I that were assigned to the same room decided to push through the fatigue and stay up until midnight to go explore the floor, or in other words, go ghost hunting. The hotel had already sketched me out when I saw the ancient looking lobby and had witnessed the hotel workers warning us not to use the lifts. We had to climb to the 15th floor. Before the trip, we already knew that this establishment had a dark history of side cover-ups. For example, we heard rumors of an unaliving on the 13th floor that caused a whole entire room to be sealed up. It's midnight, and my other friend and I decided to split up to explore both pathways of the current floor. We wanted to go hang out in the lobby, but unfortunately it was pitch black down there. Unsurprisingly, we saw nothing and proceeded back to our room for bedtime. At 4 a.m., I had a strong urge to pee and I was shivering so badly from the cold. So I got up to relieve myself and right when I finished up, I began to go back to sleep when I hear three clear knocks on the front door. I know this was dumb, but I opened the door without looking through the peephole. I swear that if it was somebody with malicious intent and not some kind of paranormal thing, that would have turned out pretty badly. As expected, I didn't see anybody though, so I just coerced myself back to sleep. I told myself that I was tired and I was probably still half dreaming. Turns out I was wrong. As I turned back, it started again, 
But this time, I did look through the peephole, because my common sense started to return. Again, nothing. I retraced my steps back to the bed and I tucked myself in while preparing mentally to just ignore the knocks. Another three knocks happened when I rested my head on the pillow. This time, I chose to not even give it a thought. The opposite happened. The knocks became louder and faster. Then they started to become bangs. It was at that moment that I knew that whatever I'd been hunting had started to play with its food. I tried waking up my friends, but to no avail. They managed to continue sleeping while I was slapping and shaking them while something was trying to get into the room. I finally gained the courage and grabbed a chair nearby. I proceeded to stand guard in front of the door. I would go on to pray while getting tormented by whatever was outside until I finally passed out at around 6 a.m. The next morning, the whole squad was asking if I had sleepwalked. I tried explaining to them what had happened, but nobody believed me. This really irritated me for like half the day until my friends from another room called us over that night to game. That night scarred me for life. This was the night that we potentially saw a real life possessed person. The teachers didn't allow us to travel between rooms to meet our friends, so we had to sneak over there. While sneaking, we saw a woman wearing a pink color baju kurum without the tudung on, on the 13th floor. We saw her when we looked down into the lobby. Her face was obscured by the floor's ceiling. She was ramming her whole body onto a random door, and she was levitating. And before we went sneaking, the class group chat had messages regarding students seeing feet floating past the bottom of their room's front doors. Before we realized that she was levitating, we thought it was just some drunk person, but soon started questioning why she would even be drinking alcohol in the first place given the culture. We started recording the situation after about three minutes of whatever that thing was banging the door, but she would burst into a sprint and dashed her way toward the lift lobby on the floor, which is a blind spot. We patiently waited until it decided to reappear. But before that, two Malay women walked past the lift lobby and headed straight to the room that the thing had been banging on. Halfway to the room, the thing in pink starts walking again, instead of levitating, behind them, and follows them right into the room. After that, we tried running back to our room, but we realized it was locked from the inside. So we spent the night over in the room we'd snuck over to. I still remember the panic that my parents had when I texted them about it. They told me to delete the footage and kept asking me if I did the room entering ritual correctly. To this day, I'm still tempted to return to that hotel, but my gut is telling me not to. Was it ghosts, mold, our imaginations? I guess I'll never know. In this tale, Reddit user expert maybe 5106 tells an eclectic mix of tales that happened at their haunted house. Here are the stories. My house has been haunted all my life. It started in the apartment I lived in as a kid, but it followed me to where I'm currently living. In the past 10 years, I've experienced more paranormal activity than most people have in their lives. It started with an attachment I had from using a Ouija board at 11 years old. Since I have so many paranormal experiences to share, I'm going to limit this story to the things that have taken place in my current home, with a focus on the most significant things to take place here over the years. To preface this, I'd like to say that I'm a 21-year-old female, but when I moved into my current home, I was 13. I was living with both of my parents, four cats, and a dog. Now it's just myself, my dad, my girlfriend, three cats, and a dog living here. The history of the house isn't overly important. We bought it from a family, the woman that lived in the house had been moved to a hospice where she'd passed away, and her kids were selling her condo. 
Her name was Helen. That is as much significant history as there is to my current home. Outside of that, it seems that the entities in our home aren't necessarily attached to the location as much as they are attached to us. A little background on the spirits in my house. I know Helen is here. She has been heard by multiple people. She has a distinct old lady perfume smell and a calming feel that comes along with her. We also have an unknown number of spirits or entities in the basement. I have a hard time explaining them because I don't know if there are multiple male human spirits or one inhuman spirit making it seem like more than one. But whatever it is, it feels dark and masculine if that makes sense. Helen mainly stays upstairs and whatever is dark typically stays in the basement. The main floor is typically more poltergeist type activity. That being said, on to some specific experiences. I'm going to start with the most asked about thing that has ever happened to me. Anyone who knows me or hears about this asks me about it. So, one day I was probably around 14. I was in my bed late at night, responding to Snapchat streaks, but being a teen laying in bed, makeup probably off, I didn't feel like sending pictures of my face or really putting any effort in. But I also didn't want to just send a black screen. So I was taking pictures of my bedroom door because our hall light was on. After snapping and sending a few photos, my camera started to struggle to focus. It wouldn't take the picture because it just kept trying to focus. Finally, the picture took and a dark black figure was peering in at me in the photo. It was out of focus, of course, but I freaked out. I looked up and saw nothing, so I snapped another photo, and that one came out clear, and there was no figure. At that time, I'd say that was the beginning of things taking a turn for the worst. A few days passed, and I had gotten three scratches down my back in the shower. My aunt had heard about what I was experiencing, and had a friend who was a Wiccan priest or something come over. I will say, I wasn't necessarily open-minded to Wicca. It seemed like BS to me at first, but this man had told me that there are ways that we can open portals between our worlds and others. Sometimes intentionally, but not always. He told me that candles give off a pure white light, but when set in front of a mirror, that light doubles and turns impure or dark. It's hard to explain, but as I understood it, a candle alone equals good, and a candle in front of a mirror equals bad. He said if you have a candle in front of a mirror and look into that, it can open a portal to darker dimensions. Again, as he was first telling me this, I was thinking that it was BS. But then I remembered, just days before I had seen the figure in my bedroom, I had taken a photo sitting in front of my bedroom mirror with a candle darn near in my lap. He told me to throw a sheet over the mirror without looking into it and get rid of it or remove it, whatever I had to do. My dad did so, and the second the sheet covered the mirror, the power went out only in my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. That was when I started to take this Wicca stuff more seriously. A little while passed and things seemed a little bit less dark or aggressive, but something was definitely still there. That's when the event occurred that caused us to call a priest to come bless our home and myself. I had been home alone one day and had an experience that is hard for me to explain. Other people will simply say that I was possessed for a few hours, but for me it's more confusing than that. I have a lapse in time, in memory, where people are telling me that I did things that I don't remember doing. I remember being on FaceTime with my best friend. I had walked into my upstairs bathroom, which is weirdly a hot spot for activity in the house, the same room that I got scratched in. After walking into the bathroom, I don't remember anything else until hours later. So what I'm telling you from here until I snapped out of it was told to me by witnesses. 
My best friend said that while on FaceTime, the lights began to flicker in the bathroom, and I just stopped talking, and it was like I was staring up ahead past my phone. My friend asked me what was wrong, and I responded with, I can't leave. There's someone blocking the door. Right away, she knew something wasn't right and told me to just go out, but I guess I ended up hanging up the phone. We had another friend who lived like two blocks away from me, so my best friend called her and told her that she needed to go check on me. When she got to my house, she looked for me everywhere. Upstairs, main floor, basement, every room, but I was nowhere to be found. Just as she was coming down the stairs to leave, she saw me standing in the middle of the main floor. If you walked into my house, you couldn't have missed me. So she asked me where I'd come from and that she'd been looking for me. She said I responded so calmly and eerily that it wasn't even like it was me talking. I told her I had been in the bathroom and she said, no, you weren't. I just looked in there. Once she said that, she said that I completely changed and she could tell that it like enraged me or something. I told her that she needed to leave and apparently I even said, you aren't welcome here. Being a 14 year old girl talking to one of her best friends, that definitely wasn't like me. She tried to argue over leaving, but apparently the more she did, the more aggressive I got about telling her to get out. So out of fear, she left and she and my friends just kept trying to call and text me to snap me out of it. Three hours passed, and no one knows what I was up to. But I posted a picture on my Snapchat story of myself in the mirror that was covered, you know, the portal mirror, with the caption saying something about it being time to stop being scared or stop running or something super creepy. The next thing I remember is sitting on the couch, and the best way I can describe it is this. It felt like waking up from a nap, except that I didn't remember falling asleep, or even going to sit on the couch. After that, we did a little bit more research, and we talked with the Wiccan priest. I ended up finding out that I had an attachment, that I created, like I said, with that Ouija board at 11, and then I just strengthened it with the mirror portal. I was blessed and so was the house, and for a long time things were better. My house, though, is still extremely haunted, and I could share a lot more about it. Little things here and there, like hearing a deep guttural growl coming from the basement stairs, my dog not being willing to go in the basement, hearing voices being touched, objects moving, stuff like that. But this story is about the craziest stuff that's happened to me. The creepiest thing I've ever seen in the middle of nowhere was in the forest at this place we called the Tar Pits. They were these deep ruts in the ground, maybe three to four feet deep, and they were filled with this purple-green muck that acted a lot like quicksand. It sucked in and consumed whatever had the unfortunate fate of wandering into it. If a small vehicle got stuck in it, it normally took a bulldozer to pull them out, with significant damage to the vehicle in the process. The stuff would rip the bumper right off a vehicle while being pulled out. One summer, we had a brutal drought, and the tar pits dried up. Along the bottom of the holes was a giant pile of bones, animals that I figure stepped in and couldn't get out. A lot were clearly deer, with some squirrels, possums, and some that could have been foxes or dogs. I haven't been over there in years, and I don't know if it's still like that. But I would love to know what that stuff was. That muck was the weirdest stuff I've ever seen. Probably not paranormal, but still creepy.
My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother and he found this house and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys. So there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99 and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it, but of course my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me, but every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry. So we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks and you might hear bumps in the night 
just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18-month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four. Because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this. You get home from a stressful day at school, and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open, and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops, and the cops came in and did an investigation, all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So, of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I going to do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other, just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door. So when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it but nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything, but just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. 
I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so is the kitchen, and the fire, and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening, or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school, so I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed. The fire. The bed breaking. The knocking. The giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more, so I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like, our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway, we looked up the address on a background search for properties. And we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliché, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids, and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway... That was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I've never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. My husband at the time and I had been married about a year, 
when one of his friends told us that they were buying a house. Their rental house would be available, and the rent was very reasonable. His wife's parents knew the owner of the house, and he was fine with us moving in. We said yes, since we were happy to leave our small apartment. My husband told me that the house was pretty nice. He and his friend's band practiced there all the time. Weird stuff started happening right away. I worked and went to school during the day, while my husband was a working musician, so he was gone until very late. I woke up in bed one night, and I heard the front screen door spring squeak open. Oh, my husband's home, I thought. He put the key in the lock, opened the door, and quietly let the screen door shut. I was still in bed as I heard him walking across the living room, so I called out hello to him and told him he doesn't need to be quiet because I'm awake. He didn't answer, so I called out again. The house was quiet. I looked at my cat, who was in bed with me, and she was on high alert, sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring at the bedroom door. I don't know how long we hid out in the bedroom, but some time later the screen opened again, and it was all louder. The door unlocked, and it was my husband this time. These events happened quite a few times, but sometimes it was just footsteps. There were often crashing sounds in the house, like a broom handle hitting the floor. Cabinet doors would be opened, and small appliances would be turned on for no good reason. We started unplugging everything when we weren't using it to avoid this. Guests, and later roommates, also experienced the same things. The house had a reputation with the neighbors, who called it Tragedy House. Once I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and a tall black thing flew from the wall behind me on my left, through the kitchen, and out the outside wall. It happened in just a second, but I remember thinking it had to hit that wall. But it didn't, it just went straight through it. The house's owner, our landlord, told me that his wife had died while they were on vacation years earlier. She fell down some stairs, leaving him with three small children. He said that she loved this house. He would always say, I can still feel her here when I come in. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, one night I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me, so I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention, and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. But things got worse as time went on, and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. 
Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me, when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months, things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room, and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small. There was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by, all I can say is it was a big man's shadow and this thing was standing at the end of the hall. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood under the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone. Just leave me the F alone. And with that, whatever it was turned sideways and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day we found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway, on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge, and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed. It was about one o'clock in the morning and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, no doctor, please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere. I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in, because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please. Help me. Like, for some reason she couldn't trust the doctor, or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor, and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything. I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me.
most people would be thrilled to move out of a haunted house. But for Reddit user Kate the Girl Who Dreams, moving out of her haunted house was different. Here's her story. So my boyfriend and I had been living in this house for a few years. He had gone overseas for a little while and then returned. A few months later, and we started to pack our bags for the move into a new place. When we finished packing up the boxes and clothes, my boyfriend did something I didn't expect him to do. He put his hands together and thanked the ghosts for helping us, and then said his goodbyes before leaving the room. He said he felt sad, and it would have been a lie if I had said I didn't feel the same way. For years, activity in that house had rather frightened him. It upset him as well, and a few times it was so bad that he cursed at them within the room as activity occurred, which is why his last action in that room surprised me. I felt that they had been heavily misunderstood, the spirits or whatever. Throughout the years, they had told me a lot about themselves. I had gathered a lot of EVPs and photos from the house. It was a love-hate relationship with them. At times, they would warn me of somebody around me. I don't really know if it was because I was the only tenant who was constantly there and who actually spoke to and got anything on them. One time, I was at work, and a customer said that he saw something like a little boy next to me. I started to recall the little boy entity who was in the house I lived in. I did a spirit box session later, and I asked if one of them had followed me to work. The little boy's voice actually responded and said, Yes, only me. I get that it was scary for some, but moving away from the haunted house was also something that felt rather saddening and freeing at the same time. It's nice in the new place. The first day and nothing paranormal had happened, a rather quiet night of sleep. It feels nice, and yet strange at the same time. Oddly lonely, but it's something my boyfriend and I will get used to. The only thing is, my boyfriend brought a piece of jewelry that one of the entities really liked with us, so we'll see how that turns out. But for now, it's quiet and peaceful, bittersweet, but still a nice change from everything that was going on before. Time for newer and better things. A change of scenery. This story comes to us from Reddit user Pineapple Juice. I believe I have told a story from them before but here are some more tales from their haunted house. I was about nine when this happened. My mom, my sister, and I moved into this old house that was built before the Second World War. My great uncle, who was a veteran, told us stories about when it was in its glory days. Everybody in our town said the place was haunted, and that just put signals off in my head especially when I remember driving past the front of the house and seeing a girl in the attic window. I eventually shrugged it off, but I still hated the house. I always felt like I was being watched, and I never felt alone. I was always uncomfortable, and I just hated it. I begged my mom not to move us in, but yeah, that didn't happen. Whether you believe in mediums or not, both of my grandmothers had a hardcore belief that we had medium blood or something like that, but that it skipped a generation. My room was the worst to be in, always freezing, always felt heavy, and always had something weird going on. My sister always hated going past my room to go to the restroom, and I always hated being in my room. When we first moved in, I would knock on the floor and something would knock back. I would grab midnight snacks and see shadow men and women and children out of the corner of my eye. One time, I was even making a sandwich and I saw a shadow man in the hall. I remember that I said hi and then continued making my sandwich. For some reason, I turned and the shadow man was maybe a foot away from me. 
It took me a moment, but then I ran to my room. Another time, I was sleeping in the living room. I felt a hand press against my back and heard light footsteps. It felt like a man's hand. My parents are divorced and no one had their boyfriend over. Another time, I had a few pieces of paper on the table in the living room. I made a joke that the ghost should move it. A moment passed and then the paper shot across the table and just stopped right on the edge. I jumped up and ran. Another time I woke up in my room and saw a girl in my doorway. And not like skin tone and hair color. She was translucent and gray with gouged out eyes and what I assume was blood going down her face. She had a dress on and a coat. I stayed frozen before I finally jumped up and moved past her. My sister shrugged it off until her boyfriend stayed in my room while I was over at my grandparents' house. He saw the same exact thing, but he shrugged it off until he heard about my story. What made it so much weirder is that what he described is the same girl from the window and the girl that was in my room. There are lots of little stories about this house, but hopefully you enjoyed those. For some backstory, I'm a 26-year-old female. I grew up in a very haunted house. The woods were also haunted. It was in rural Appalachian, Pennsylvania. Our area had a lot of mining and Native American history. The oldest known site of human habitation was just a few miles away. Our house was also built near the portal to an abandoned mine where an accident took place. I've experienced noises, voices, things moving, and figures from a young age. I assume I have attachments. I no longer live in my childhood home. Things have started everywhere that I lived to some extent, but never as bad as there. This post is about where I live now, and I'm hoping to get some advice on what to do, or some possible reasons behind it. Currently, I moved in with my partner, who's a 26-year-old male, last summer. He bought the home in 2020 and says that he never experienced anything, and neither did his roommate. I moved in right after the roommate moved out. It was built in the 50s, no odd history that I know of. It's a pretty quiet suburb, right outside the city. One of the things that happens is that things move. I remember carrying a military duffel bag upstairs while I was moving in, and I stacked one on top of the other. A few hours later, I heard a loud bang upstairs. The top one was on the floor, in front of the bottom one. It wasn't like it rolled off, but more like it had been placed, or dropped. It was upright. A few days later, my folded flag from my re-enlistment was knocked off the windowsill but all the windows were closed, and I checked for drafts. Two weeks ago, I actually watched my partner's GameCube slide over about two inches on our TV stand. It's not plugged into anything. It's just the box sitting there, so it's not like the dogs could have pulled the cables. This was a common theme in my childhood home as well. It got so bad I had to fall asleep with movies on, because if it was silent, I would have to listen to things falling off my dressers, toys falling, things sliding, and so on. Another thing that happens is footsteps. I've heard heavy boot footsteps coming up the stairs and stopping in front of the bedroom door multiple times. It sounds so real that I've actually grabbed my gun thinking someone broke in. The last time it happened, a few weeks ago, my dogs heard it and walked over to the door. They didn't bark, they just sniffed. Most of the time it happens when I'm home alone, but there was one time when my partner heard it too. This has also happened at multiple locations. I've heard the same heavy footsteps that stop at the doorway, at my ex's house, and also an apartment I lived in. 
I've also seen figures. It was early morning. I was half asleep and I heard the footsteps. This time they came into the room. I thought it was my partner home from work. When I opened my eyes, he was already laying next to me and sleeping. I didn't see anything. Nobody was in the room. When he woke up, I told him about it. And he said that he had a dream that night where someone was in the house walking around and that he saw a figure standing in our room. A black figure with weird eyes. He said that he's dreamed about a figure in our room a few times since he started seeing me. My ex also experienced the same thing and would sometimes see black figures or a man with a mustache in the room in his dreams, but only when he was with me. One of my friends also saw a man with a mustache standing next to my bunk in her dream while we were at training a few years ago. We've heard voices as well. My partner has heard me calling his name or saying, babe, in the next room when I'm actually upstairs and didn't say anything. This has happened about five times. It's another thing that used to happen to me in the house that I grew up in. I would hear a woman saying my name in the next room when my mom wasn't home. Last night, I woke up and saw the shadow of my dog sitting upright on the end of our bed. I could see the shape blocking out the light of the TV behind him. I could see shoulders. Sometimes my dog gets too hot and can't sleep and will sit up like that. So I reached forward to pet him and my hand didn't touch a thing. He was actually laying down flat on his side. The shadow was behind him. I didn't have my contact lenses in, so I couldn't see too clearly. My regular eyesight is horrible. I just see shapes. I turned my phone flashlight on and the upright shadow disappeared. I haven't seen a figure since I lived in the first house, which is why I'm concerned. Little things have always started after I moved in somewhere, but it's escalating faster this time. This brings me back to the mine behind our childhood home. Two months ago, my two brothers, my partner and I decided to go back to those woods and try to find the entrance. Well, we found it. The portal was collapsed and they tried digging it out. We found pieces of the old mine cars and we all brought a little something home. Do you think it could be escalating because we went back? And not only that, I brought a piece of a mine car into our house without even thinking about the repercussions? Now I'm worried. I haven't told my partner about the figure. And now I'm just wondering what comes next. I'm a skeptic, but I used to be obsessed with anything paranormal. I lost interest as I got older. I used to believe anything that I would see on those weird history channel shows about Bigfoot and UFOs. It's not like I think that any of this is impossible. It's just that I'm much harder to convince now. I try to take any footage or pictures of this stuff as rationally as I can. Usually, the simplest explanation is the explanation. Ironically though, I saw something that no matter how hard I try, I cannot explain. Years ago, I was at a party at a house surrounded by woods, miles and miles of isolated Pennsylvania mountains. I got bored and I asked my cousin if he wanted to go for a walk. As we left the property, we had to go down a pretty deep slope that was crowded by rusted out cars, which had been there for over a decade. We found a clearing with a shack that looked like somebody was in the process of demolishing it. And after looking inside, we went back to the party to grab my younger brother. This was back when I was still pretty invested in the paranormal. So before we walked into the clearing again, I got the camera ready on my phone, just in case. The sun was starting to set 
and as we left the tree line, I saw it. Something streaked out in front of me. It was a line of small, bluish orbs, and honestly the best way I can describe it is like the fairies in Ocarina of Time, except they moved so much faster. They were only there for a second, fading in and then fading out, almost faster than I could react. I managed to take a picture, but I thought, there's no way I managed to get that. With the sun going down, we had to investigate the shack quickly. I took a few more pictures of the inside and hurried out of there. When we got back, I looked through the photos, and to my absolute shock, I did manage to get whatever the heck that was. The photo came out strange, though. The photo was more like an elongated blob of bright yellow and white, not what I had seen. Surprisingly, nobody seemed to believe me, other than a couple of close friends who were into weird things too. Everybody told me that I was mistaken, and one friend even accused me of fabricating it. The worst one was my dad. This dude will believe any fringe idea or conspiracy theory. For example, he once got a ghost detecting app and was absolutely convinced that his dead cousin was trying to contact him from beyond the grave through a free iPhone app. Of course, he thought I was lying about this, though. I tried to come up with some kind of explanation for what I saw, but I couldn't. I'm not going to say it was a ghost or a spirit, because I would have no way of proving that. Electromagnetic fields can make people see things like that, but that doesn't explain the fact that I had a picture of it, even if it was different. I'm not convinced that it was any weather phenomenon either, since it was a bright, sunny summer day. And fireflies don't look like amorphous blobs of light on camera. Really, all I know is what it wasn't. I guess in true story fashion, those pictures are stuck on a phone and a laptop that no longer work. I am planning on trying to retrieve them at some point. I don't believe the picture had anything to do with the computer or the phone breaking, of course. I've heard people say stuff about ghost pictures causing electronics to stop working. But both of those devices were pretty old, and they didn't stop working until years after I took those pictures. Whether or not you believe me is fine, but I hope you enjoyed the story anyway. I have always believed in the paranormal. As a child, it fascinated me in many different and sometimes terrifying ways. I grew up in a mid-sized to small former coal mining city in Pennsylvania. My house at the time was an older, small, three-bedroom house in a historically lower income area. For as long as I can remember, I have felt the presence of spirits in that home. As a child, I would wake up constantly in the middle of the night, sweating and in fear that something was watching me from the far left corner of my room. That feeling never went away, but got stronger. I never felt alone while living in that home, always on edge. It got to the point where I was late in my teens, still sleeping with the lights on, because I was that terrified of the presence that lingered over me at night. In terms of seeing things, the only truly horrifying image I remember seeing was as a child. I was opening up my downstairs bathroom door, and I saw my dog as a rotting corpse staring back at me. When I shut the door and reopened it, the image was gone. My dog was alive and totally fine at the time. My dogs would bark at random noises in the house, and would sometimes bark at nothing at all. But the animals of my house would never come into my room. They would always whine by the door and scratch until I let them out. I never really thought about that until now. One thing that would happen to everyone in the house was things going missing. Granted, we were a large family in a smaller home, but things were always moving around and never in the same place that we remember putting them. In my room, this was a constant experience that I could never escape. 
I suppose here I should put a content warning for mental health and mentions of societal ideation. One thing that always stuck with me was the way that that house made me feel mentally. Granted, my family dynamic didn't help the situation. It's much better now, but at the time, it was rocky. But the best way that I can put it into words was it felt like something was sucking the energy and life out of my existence. I felt the most depressed and suicidal I ever have in the span of four years while living in this house. During this time, these feelings of being watched and stalked were at their highest. I felt truly and utterly alone, and yet my presence was never alone. A lot of these problems would end up fading, but never really went away. My grandfather would pass in 2016, and since then, the entire energy of my house changed. My mental health improved immensely, and those feelings of being watched felt more comfortable and warming rather than cold and negative. You could feel a shift in the entire home's dynamic, and just our overall moods and emotions were more stable. I felt comfortable staying home alone, and simply using a nightlight to sleep. The last time I lived in that house full-time was in 2019. I moved away for college and would only go home to visit. I would be home for maybe two to three days with a five-day visit for Christmas, but an energy was still there whenever I walked through that door. My friends from college would feel that same energy too. I asked my one friend as we were driving back from Pennsylvania to New York, where we were in college, if she felt like my house was haunted. And without any hesitation, she said, oh, a thousand percent. Let's flash forward to this year. My family moved from the city to the mountains. We're now living in a converted cabin near a lake three miles off a dirt road. During the day, it's beautiful and serene. At night, it's really creepy. Just a darkness. I wrote it off, thinking I just wasn't used to the new environment, since I live just outside of New York City. The first time that I went home to visit the new house, I was only there for one day. The second time, I spent two nights with my friend from college. We slept in the same room, and she would tell me how I would talk in my sleep, something I've never done before. The second night, I would wake up in the middle of the night, shouting full sentences and having the worst time going back to bed. The next morning when I woke up, there were scratches all over my neck and upper back. My fingernails are not long, so there's no way that I could have done that to myself at all. That was back in April. More recently, I went home for three weeks. This would be the longest I would stay in the house thus far. I began to hear the voices of my loved ones clear as day in the middle of the night, despite those people being asleep or across the house from me. That feeling of being watched was back, and it felt more negative than how I even remembered it. I continued to talk in my sleep, to wake up in the middle of the night, drenched in sweat despite the room being freezing cold, and I would always feel uneasy at night. I'm back in New York and nothing has happened here. My family claims nothing weird has happened to them in the house, so I don't really know what to think. Am I crazy, or is that presence back from the past to haunt me? Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. 
Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods, and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields. Basically, a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield 1, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before, and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or he had gotten lost, but he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot, but the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking the thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then, a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long. But he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck. I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again though, and I don't plan on ever going back. In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, 
I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. I was just thinking of an experience I had one weekend this past summer. I've had many extremely dark paranormal experiences but this wasn't one of them. It was still emotionally intense and profound in its own way though. I was at an outdoor music festival in Virginia in the United States. It was on an old farm. The property was huge with big rolling fields and a few various small buildings littered about. After that evening's show got called off due to threatening electrical storms and crazy strong wind, I started walking across a field toward a little old shack set back among a few trees. The setting was surreal, like out of a movie. The sky was swirling and churning with dark gray-black clouds. The wind was strong, but felt very refreshing after a hot, sunny, sweaty day. The electricity in the air was palpable. Everything felt slightly charged. As I started walking into the middle of the field, suddenly everybody was gone. I couldn't see or hear a single person from the festival. I kept walking across the field to the shack, and I was feeling very heavy emotionally. There was a definite presence, not malevolent, but heavy. When I got to the shack, I collapsed on my knees and I began weeping and apologizing repeatedly. This went on probably for a few minutes, but it felt like it was happening outside of time. It felt to me at this point like I was addressing formerly enslaved people who had lived and worked on the property. It was like they were all around me. Eventually I stood up. I felt pleasantly exhausted after a big emotional release. I still hadn't seen or heard anyone from the festival since I had first walked away from them. I began walking back slowly toward the field where my car was, and the rain started pouring down. I soaked it all in as I walked back to my car. That night, after it became clear that the storm was going to prevent any further music from happening, I drove back to my motel room in heavy rain. I was awake in bed at 3 a.m. or so, when I heard a creaking noise that turned out to be the mini fridge door slowly opening. I got up to check it out. I thought maybe the magnet on the mini fridge was weak, but it wasn't. It was very strong. There was no way this thing opened on its own. So I knew that something was there with me. I wasn't quite confident yet in my ability to assess the situation accurately on the spot so I was feeling a bit leery and self-protective. But as some time went by, I grew more relaxed, and I sensed that the spirit was not malevolent. I sensed that she was a female spirit of a formerly enslaved person who had followed me back to my motel room. The energy in the room wasn't dark or ominous. It was like a mixture of sorrow, exhaustion, curiosity, and relief. 
I looked up the history of the property that the festival was being held at, and I confirmed that the property had been home to many enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. I found myself wishing that I had been more comforting and explicitly accepting of her during those first few hours. I hope she was able to pass on after our encounter. In a way, I feel like she followed me back from the farm before she chose to pass on, because I was a curiosity to her, or maybe because I had shown kindness. Something that makes this experience stand out to me is that I rarely encounter human spirits like this. Mostly, I only encounter human spirits remotely through other people. My immediate radius is always so full of other non-human entities that I think most human spirits just steer clear. But there are a few things about the way this encounter unfolded that I think allowed for it to happen as it did. I had driven 12 hours to get there on the previous day, so there wasn't the usual residual dark energy just hanging around from the get-go. I also feel like the intense swirling electrical wind and rainstorms that surrounded the festival for multiple days created a unique situation energetically. Either way, it was an emotional experience, and it felt cleansing. I live in North Dakota, in cattle country. In 2019, my grandpa passed away in the old farmhouse, which was the homestead for multiple generations. He died of side. It came out of nowhere and took everybody by shock. He was a very stubborn, independent man, so I just assumed that he preferred to die his own way, as opposed to being sent to some kind of old age home. He was also known to drink heavily from time to time. My father and I found him in his rocking chair, with the gun on his lap. Since then, there have been a run of odd events happening in and around the farmhouse and yard. Early on, it was just little things. Doors opening that shouldn't be. Unexplainable sounds in other parts of the house when nobody was there. One time, I thought I saw my grandpa in the mirror behind me. Overall, creepy vibes, generic haunting stuff. I inherited the yard. It's been vacant since my grandpa's death. I was excited to fix it up and start fresh. One day, I was in the tree line cleaning up dead trees when I heard three distinct gunshots, like shots that seemed 50 yards away. I literally hit the ground. After a while, I got up, but there was no one around. About 10 minutes later, an old friend of my grandpa's drove into the yard. I had known him for years. He pulled up and I asked him if he knew who'd been shooting. He said it wasn't him and that he saw nobody around. He didn't seem himself. He was usually a happy guy, but on this day he seemed distracted, like he was in a fog. He said, are you sure you should live here? I said yes, that I was excited to rebrand the yard. Not long after that, he left. About a month later, he died of a stroke. The day following the gunshots, my daughter, who was five at the time, and I were in the old house. She was playing with a toy train while I was cleaning. She abruptly stood up and said, I want to go home. I followed her out of the house and helped her into my truck. She asked me if I could go get her train. When I went back into the house, it was like walking into a different universe. It was freezing cold. I could see my own breath. The house was the same, but the colors were different. Almost muted. I was freaked out and left the house too. When I left, I heard thumping on the walls and siding of the house. Freaky stuff. I got in my truck and sped out. When we were a couple of miles away, I stopped and I asked my daughter what she had seen. She said that she saw a man with a pointy hat in the house. She hasn't been allowed in the yard since. I returned later that night. 
Stupid, I know. And I took pictures of the house. And when I looked at them later, there appeared to be a shadow figure with a pointed hat looking at me. I could only see it in pictures though, not in real time. I met with a pastor and he told me that what I was describing, the change in temperature, the muted colors, all tell of demonic activity. He agreed to pray and anoint and bless the house. When we went to the house, I was expecting fireworks really, but nothing happened. In fact, it was calm and peaceful. I was optimistic that things were better. And they were, for some time. To clarify, the house is vacant, but my father and I still have cattle on the yard. And here are some of the things that have been happening over the past year. When I'm on the yard, I have unexplainable phantom pains in my left hand. Only when I'm on the yard and nowhere else. A stabbing pain in the palm of just my left hand. There was a large dead coyote in our shop. No evidence of how it got in there. One day, my dad drove into the yard and found our large bull trapped in a bale feeder. No explanation for that either. We found a cow dead with a broken neck in the corral. When I approached the carcass, my left hand began to throb. I could smell a unique scent not associated with livestock. I've been around dead animals, but this was different. All of these things led me to tell my story. We've attempted spiritual intervention and things just seem to be getting worse. I don't know what the significance of the pointed hat demon is. I know of the hat man, but this isn't linked to sleep paralysis at all. Can anyone explain the phantom pain in my left hand? What was the significance of the three gunshots? My grandpa was an avid hunter. Was this a warning from him? Honestly, any advice would be appreciated. My parents recently bought a farm last year in Australia and have been building a property on it for their retirement. It's right beside a national park and reasonably close to the next property over. The only thing that sucks is that we have no cell service besides the top paddock where they're building their house. Not too dodgy, right? Well, I'm a university student, 21 year old female in my second year of nursing and I frequently come up to the farm to help them out with their livestock and whatnot. At first, everything was fine. We had a small two bedroom cabin in the lower paddock that I stayed in every time I came up. My room had a large window that faced the national park and at night when it was pitch black, it would really freak me out a bit, but nothing serious. Sure, we had the usual noises of foxes and livestock at nighttime but nothing out of the ordinary. Things really ramped up when I had to stay there alone to feed the livestock for a few days while my parents were back in the city. I went about the usual chores, feeding the sheep, keeping an eye on our lambs, and checking in at the building site to keep an eye on everything. I went into town to get some dinner at the local pub, and by the time I got home, it was roughly 10 p.m., I would usually take my car up to the top paddock at night to call my friends, check social media, and so on. My car was lit up by internal navigation systems, which meant that I couldn't really see outside the car besides whatever my headlights lit up. I was midway through my social media scrolling when I thought I saw something black flash across the paddocks where my headlights were facing. I drove my car in a quick circle to use my car's headlights as a massive torch, but I didn't see anything. No reflections of cattle's eyes like I normally do, or the usual fox or rabbit. There was nothing. I tried not to pay too much attention to it, and I went back to my social media scroll. Until I accidentally pressed my brakes, which allowed my brake lights to flood the paddock behind my car with an eerie red light. The same black flash that I had seen through my front windshield flickered out of the corner of my eye in the rearview mirror. Now I was suspicious. 
I turned off the music I'd been listening to and just sat for a second, trying to assure myself I was just tired. After a few seconds of silence, I was relieved and was about to turn my car on to go back to the cabin. And that's when I heard what I can only describe as claws on my rear windshield. Tap, tap, scratch. I have never sped as fast as I did back to the cabin that night. That night, I couldn't shake the feeling of something watching me from the forest. You know that sort of tingling sensation of something staring into the back of your head? After tossing and turning, I put up a newspaper in front of my window, the one that faces the woods, until it was completely covered. The feeling immediately went away. Still, it's safe to say that sleep did not come easily. The following night, I chose to go to the top paddock while it was still reasonably light. All was pretty peaceful, and I had all but forgotten about the previous night's events. I was admiring the gorgeous pink sunset, when I saw a flash of green in the sky travel for a split second, and then disappear. Now listen, I'm not one for UFOs, but I know it wasn't a helicopter, because it was light enough to see the sky, and the stars weren't even out yet. I thought it was cool, so I called one of my friends who's a massive skeptic about everything paranormal. Of course, she thought I was nuts and proceeded to give me crap for it. It started to get a bit dark for my liking, so I went back to the cabin and cooked some dinner. All was fine, until I went to sleep, the newspaper from the night before still clinging to my window. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to a sound. I went to take a look on foot with my spotlight. Now, usually, when you bring a very bright light and irritate the sheep, who were already going nuts, you hear about it. Keyword being, usually. I walked over to the paddock and started scanning with my spotlight, and I didn't see anything. The sheep were bleating like crazy, but none were injured or even remotely in a corner of the paddock, huddled together like they usually do when there's a fox or a predator. That was, until they all went silent. One second they were so loud that they echoed around the hills, and the next, it was dead silent. Now I was truly scared. I raised my rifle and started looking around, feeling like everything around me had its eyes on me. It was then that I heard a thump of something heavy being dropped on the ground, heavy enough for me to feel the vibration in my feet. I booked it back to the cabin and locked everything behind me. I was pacing around, double-checking the doors and windows, when I heard it. It sounded like humming, but it was distorted and there were footsteps with it. These footsteps were not human though. It's like something was limping and then quickly recovering. Step, 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 around the cabin and stopping at my bedroom window. I curled to the ground, gripping my rifle until my fingers were frozen in place. And that's how I fell asleep that night. I left first thing in the morning without even looking to see if there were footprints or anything else. If anyone has any clue what's going on, or what this thing is, and can tell me what I can do, let me know, because I haven't been able to go back to my parents' farm ever since. My grandmother would always tell me about knocking that she would hear, either a few days before or moments before somebody close to her would pass away. It would usually be around three knocks, in no particular place. She said that she would sometimes hear it at the back door, behind the wall, or coming from outside. My grandmother had always kind of had this weird gift, to see and experience things that were... I guess paranormal, for lack of a better word. She would always tell me her experiences, 
And me, being not the bravest person on earth, would get so scared I wouldn't be able to sleep well for days. I always thought the knocks were interesting whenever she told me about them, because not long after, it usually happened, someone would die, or she would complain for days that she wasn't sleeping. Then the knocks would happen, as well as other weird things. I was very open to the idea of these knocks due to the fact that evidently people sometimes passed away after, and I believed that things like that could happen. Last year, the three knocks happened to me. It was a Friday morning, and that entire week, my grandmother's sister, Sari, was fighting COVID in a hospital. Sari was the second closest thing to a grandmother for me, so I had a great love for her. I wouldn't say we were close, but there was that grandmotherly love that she had always given me. When I woke up, I was still between that state of being very sleepy, but also fully aware of my surroundings, as I wasn't asleep. I know that I had my back to the door of my room when I heard three faint but audible knocks on my door. I opened my mouth to say, yes, and then it hit me like a train that I heard absolutely nobody walk to the door or open any of the doors we had in the hallway. And trust me when I say I have the loudest family, so I should have heard someone or something. My body froze and a chill went right down my back. For a good minute, I was too terrified to move. I laid in bed for a while to listen if anybody would maybe walk away or open the door to confirm that it was indeed one of my family members, but nothing just silence after that. I even thought maybe it was my brother trying to scare me. But, long story short, exactly three days later after I heard the three knocks, my grandmother's sister, sorry, passed away in the morning. The whole experience freaked me out, and I still struggled to comprehend what happened, but it did. There's probably a logical explanation, but the fact that she died a while after really scared me and it made me think about what my grandmother had always told me. This happened to me when I was a toddler, from around one to three years old. When I was little, I used to have really bad nightmares. They were so bad that I'd wake up in the middle of the night, screaming like I was being murdered. At one point, it got so bad that my parents actually called 911 because they weren't even sure if I was breathing or not. What were these nightmares about? Being so young, it's pretty hard to remember, but I can recall two of these nightmares. In the first one, I was at my grandparents' house, playing with a toy on the floor, while my grandma was doing something in the kitchen. Then, their dog barked from the other side of the house. I heard my grandma yell, Hey! at the dog. As soon as that happened, everything went quiet. I looked up from the toy to see a tall, shadowy figure where my grandma had been moments before. It just stood there, staring at me. It didn't have any distinguishable features. It was like I was staring at the shadow of a tall, skinny person. The second one is a lot shorter, but it's the one I remember the most. I was in my crib at night when I heard something from the doorway. I looked over to see the exact same shadowy figure staring directly at me from the doorway. I don't remember any of the other night terrors that I had when I was a kid, but I'm sure that they all involved this thing. It got to the point where I was terrified of shadows and loud noises. I understand why I was afraid of shadows, but for the life of me, I can't explain where the fear of loud noises came from. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that my grandma shouted at her dog right before the shadow person showed up. Maybe it had nothing at all to do with those nightmares. I really don't know. Normally, I wouldn't be concerned by this. For all I know, 
I saw something like this on TV when I was little and had nightmares about it. I wouldn't even consider it a paranormal experience if my mom hadn't seen the same thing I did. She came home late one night to find the entire apartment dark. Assuming my dad had just left for work, she walked toward her bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway and across from mine. That's when she saw the tall shadowy figure at the end of the hall in front of my bedroom. At first she assumed it was my dad, so she got mad at it for scaring the heck out of her, but the figure didn't move. She reached behind her to turn on the light and the figure vanished. She told me about this years later and my dad backs up the claim since he recalls getting a panicked phone call from my mom saying that there was a ghost in the apartment. And that's where it ends. A few years later, we moved out of that apartment, and I have never experienced anything to do with that shadow ever again. Ever since then, I always sleep with the hallway light on, because I'll never forget the feeling of absolute terror I had when I saw that shadowy figure staring at me from the doorway. This story takes place in 2010. When I was in high school, I worked at the movie theater in town. It was an awesome first job. Free popcorn, soda, and candy, and I got to watch movies whenever I wanted. The owners would even let me bring friends in after hours to watch movies or play games on the big screen. It was pretty normal for my friends to drive around town and randomly stop by the theater when they knew I was working not much else to do in a small town. Two of my friends, Taylor, nicknamed Tiege, and Justin, stopped by and hung out in the lobby with me while we waited for the movie to end. Tiege told me that he had heard a rumor of some weird lights out in an old cemetery just outside of town. Tiege was a pathological liar, so I doubted almost everything that came out of his mouth. Justin started to back up what Tiege was saying, so I told them that as soon as I had finished up cleaning the theater, I would close up and drive out to the cemetery with them. The late show finished, I cleaned the theater, and I locked up at around 1 a.m. I honestly had no idea what to expect, so I told them that I would drive. At the time, I drove my dad's F-150 Ford pickup truck, so the three of us squeezed into the front seat and they directed me out to the cemetery. I thought for sure they were messing with me, but after about 20 minutes of driving on old country roads, we came up to a bridge, which was at the bottom of a hill. The bridge was surrounded by woods, and the cemetery was at the top of the hill. The bridge looked super old, and I wasn't sure if it would hold the weight of the truck, so I parked the truck right in front of it. Tiege told me to turn the truck off and said he was getting out. At this point, I didn't really trust Tiege, and I was also freaked out because we were at a cemetery at 2 o'clock in the morning, so I told them that I was staying in the truck. They caved and stayed in the truck with me. About five or so minutes pass, and we're starting to see these fireflies. It was so dark and clear out that we could even see them in the woods around us. I asked Tiege if those were the lights he saw. But before he could answer, he pointed up at the top of the hill, and that's when I saw a giant blue light. Once I looked at this blue light at the top of the hill, several others popped up in the woods around us, and then more up in the actual cemetery. The lights looked like they were blinking, but this could have also been from them moving around in the woods where trees were blocking the light. I started freaking out, and I was screaming at both of them, and I told them that if they were playing some kind of elaborate prank on me, it wasn't funny and that I was leaving. I tried to start the truck, but it turned once and then died. Tiege had a shocked look on his face, which only made me more anxious. 
At this point, I was crying, borderline hysterical, and I kept pumping the gas while turning the key. I didn't look up. I didn't want to. Finally, after what felt like forever, the truck started. I looked up and saw that blue light at the top of the hill was now in the middle of the bridge and had taken the shape of a torso. At this point, I had no clue what was happening, but I just had a really bad feeling and I knew I needed to get us out of there. Tiege was yelling at me to stay there, that he wanted this thing to get closer, but I wasn't hearing it. I was shaking and I threw the truck into reverse and sped back the way we came. We were quiet the whole way back to the theater. I dropped Tiej and Justin off at their car and drove home. I sat up in bed on the computer searching to see if I could find any explanation for what I had seen. Angels? Demons? Spirit orbs? Aliens? No idea. It all seemed like BS to me, but I still couldn't logically explain what I saw. The following morning, I went to Brittany's house. Brittany was my best friend at the time, and I knew she would believe me. As soon as I told her about the story, she asked me to drive her out there, so I did. We parked in front of the bridge, walked up the hill, and then around the cemetery. We looked for LED lights on tombstones, flashlights, footprints, anything, but we didn't see a thing that could explain what I saw the night before. The cemetery was way too far away from any major road for it to have been car lights. I still don't know what we saw that night, and I get goosebumps every time I think about it. If anything, it's helped me keep an open mind about the weird stuff that happens. When I was growing up, there was enough family drama to want to scream. I spent most of my teenage years living with my older sister and her husband. She lives in a really old house in the downtown area in a city in Texas. Now this old house looked like it was about to collapse, even to this day, and I'm in my late 20s. It all started when I first began staying with her. Her son, when he would visit, stayed in the guest room so I just had a habit of sleeping on the couch, because the room was typically taken. We had a long night of movies, snacks, and staying up, as siblings do, and she eventually went to bed. I remember slowly drifting off, and just as I was about to give in to the comforting lull of sleep, there was an intense feeling that somebody was watching me. Now, downtown isn't known for being safe. I was hoping that I wouldn't look toward her window and see a face looking in to rob the place. I didn't, but instead I was greeted with a short, pale boy with no eyes. He wore old clothes. They looked to be 20th century. The overalls and everything, like a little house on the prairie vibe. He had dark hair and literally black holes where his eyes should have been. I'll never forget the wave of sadness that hit me. I began to cry. I can't even say that I felt fear. It was like I was thrown into a deep, instant depression. Finally, I was able to call for my sister. The boy continued to stare until she turned on the light. She refused to believe me that night. I was so insistent. Later, other things began to happen and she started to see what I meant. Little things, such as cabinets opening and closing in the middle of the day, doors opening and closing, running through the halls, the back gate being left open. Thankfully, the dog stayed home. One night, we heard knocking on the door to the backyard. We always used that door because the front door and side door weren't over by the garage, so it was just easier. Expecting her husband, who worked the night shift, to be coming for his lunch, she opened the door and screamed. He was there, standing in the doorway and just staring 
as he did before. She also began to cry. That's when it got worse. The doors and cabinets opened and closed all day and night. You'd feel somebody sit on the bed or the couch with you. Eventually, I took over the guest room until her son came to visit. I couldn't even face outward toward the mirror. Everything told me not to. So, I would face the wall until I would almost fall asleep and then feel somebody sit on the bed with my sister, dead asleep. I knew it wasn't her. She also started seeing him standing in her driveway, staring out into traffic all day or night until somebody would drive up. The boy started showing up everywhere. The last two times we came into contact with him were the worst. One happened when we got back pretty late from Walmart. We had a spur of the moment, midnight Walmart trip. We bought some groceries and food for all the pets and came home. She stepped out into the garage and all we heard were deafening screams. I looked over to see my sister also screaming as a handprint formed on her wrist and she dropped the groceries. We left them until morning we were so scared. The last and final time was, unfortunately, all for me. My sister worked at a World War II museum that was just a couple of blocks away, and I volunteered there. That was also haunted beyond belief, but that's a long story for another day. Anyway, she came to pick me up, since I wanted to sleep in on my weekend. I went after lunch to help clean up the place. She said that was fine by her, but just asked me to be quiet because her husband had just come home and she didn't want me to wake him. I knew the drill. Drink some coffee, hang out, and text some friends. I paused because I heard the shower running in their bedroom. John never showered with me in there. So I peeked down the hallway, which had a direct view of their room. John was passed out. He wasn't even awake. I stood there for a moment, confused. Then I heard the running and screams. Directly in front of me, I hear, Daddy, no, please. I was then pushed right into the door to the outdoor garage and a whisper that said, Help me. Right in my ear. I bailed. I ran outside just as my sister drove into the driveway under the garage. We never saw or heard him again. She says it's been peaceful ever since I left her house. He's never shown himself again. She has a huge hole under her house where animals go all the time. I'm guessing that's where he is. And he showed me how he died that morning. I can say that I hope that he's at peace. And whatever happened to him never gets shown to anyone else again. I'm a 30-year-old man, blonde, blue-eyed, and a work ethic like Boxer from Animal Farm. I work at a BJ's wholesale club from 8 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon, pushing carts, filling propane tanks, and helping out where they need me. In the mornings, I usually walk around the parking lot while listening to a queue of music and podcasts that I line up for myself the day before, all of it going in through one earbud while I have the other ear open paying attention to my surroundings. Also, I'm not really prone to unusual or paranormal happenings in my life, so needless to say, the following event really caught me by surprise. To set the stage, it was between 8 and 9 in the morning. The sun was out, and I'd already gotten the propane filling station set for the day and I pushed all the shopping carts left in the parking lot and stalls overnight back to where they needed to be near the store entrance. I'm about to do what I call my morning perimeter walk. This walk involves walking the outer edge of the parking lot and behind the store to make sure that nothing is out of place and that nobody has taken it upon themselves to tag the back of the store, leaving me to photograph it and show the store management at the most opportune moment. I've just started my perimeter walk 
and I'm just about into an episode of the Rooster Teeth podcast, always open on Spotify. I'm minding my own business, tunnel visioning out, and suddenly I hear a woman's voice humming in my left ear. Thinking back, it reminded me a little bit of the lullaby hummed by the Huntress in the game Dead by Daylight. This snapped me out of my routine. I paused the podcast, and I took the earbud out of my right ear. I listened carefully to get an idea of where the humming was coming from for about a minute and a half, but it had completely stopped. All I heard was the usual background noise. It was too close for it to be any car audio from a car pulling out from behind me. I would have heard the engine and the sound of the tires against the pavement and veered out of the way for them to pass. I want to make it clear that nobody is walking around the parking lot aside from me. Everyone else is either filling up at the gas station or in the store. There's a manager who comes out and sits in their truck at the end of the parking lot where this happened, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen when this took place. After coming to grips with the fact that I'm nearing my two-year anniversary working at the store and that there's no way it was anything that wanted to hurt me, I just shrugged it off and continued onward to tackle the rest of the day. I had never had an auditory experience like that before in the nearly two years that I've worked there, and I didn't experience anything like that for the rest of that weekend. I don't know if anybody else has had an experience like that, but if you have, let me know. I'd honestly like to share in the experience. I didn't believe in ghosts for the first 22 years of my life, until I spent three months living in a haunted cabin. I always thought that there was some reasonable explanation for hauntings, and honestly sometimes I still do. Maybe this wasn't a ghost, maybe it was some kind of weird gravitational energy messing with things, but I'm getting ahead of myself. My roommate and I, let's call him Derek, moved out to Colorado with meager savings into a small cabin that was pretty much out in the boonies. Our closest neighbors used their cabins as summer homes, so we didn't really have anybody nearby. That's what's cool about living in the mountains, though. There's a sense of total isolation that you won't get anywhere else. You can turn off everything in your living space and hear nothing but the breeze. No highways, no car alarms, nothing. It's very peaceful. But after the first week or two in this cabin, Derek and I began to notice weird things happening. First, there was this eerie feeling that we would get. I remember Derek once joking with me that he didn't like being in the cabin alone because it gave him creepy vibes. There was one back room in particular where if you stood in it at night, you would feel like you were being watched Sometimes I would come home from work and just have this sense of total dread and unease with no explanation. At the time, I wrote it off as me just being paranoid. You know, hallucinating stuff that isn't there because I wasn't used to the total silence and winter isolation. I started noticing things getting moved around as well. One morning, my car keys would be missing and I'd frantically search, only to find them in a weird spot like on top of our refrigerator. I thought Derek was just messing with me, but he kept insisting that it wasn't him. Soon, he started having his stuff get moved too, and he would get really irritated at me, thinking that I was trying to prank him back, even though he hadn't pranked me in the first place. One night we were sitting around playing video games, when something flew across our field of vision. We both looked at each other for a second, before realizing that we had both seen it. For context, the cabin was a typical A-frame, so for the most part, it was one big room separated into a loft and a downstairs, with the kitchen and our beds at one end, and the living room, TV, wood stove at the other. Whatever small object flew across the room had gone from the kitchen all the way to the front door. We examined it closer, 
and found out that it was a single green bean from our meal that evening. We kind of held it up and looked at it for a second. It had flown all the way across the house, from the stovetop in the back, all the way to our front door. We really didn't have anything to say about it. It was just super weird. The next morning, though, was when I knew our house was haunted. I was watching some TV in the front room, when BAM! The roll of paper towels we had sitting on our kitchen counter flew into the table and knocked a glass of water everywhere. The roll had been thrown with force, to the point where I thought Derek had tried to chuck it at me. I turned around to tell him off, but then I realized he wasn't there. He'd been in the shower the whole time, getting ready for work. I felt a chill go down my spine. Some force, spirit, ghost, whatever, had thrown this thing across the room. Derek didn't believe me when I told him, and I couldn't blame him, but he soon came to his senses. The next couple of months were crazy. Everything from car keys to full decks of cards to box cutters would be thrown around our apartment right in front of our eyes. We'd hear weird growling sounds at night that sounded like they were right in the middle of our house. To be fair, sound carries strangely in the mountains, so maybe we were just hearing some nearby animals, but still. One time, my roommate stormed out of the shower, furious. What the heck? He said. Why would you turn the lights out on me in the shower? I told him I had no idea what he was talking about. But by far the most frustrating thing was how our stuff just kept going missing. I mean, it got ridiculous. One night we left our car keys in a very particular spot just to see if they had been moved in the morning. When we woke up, they were gone. But not just that, they had been tucked between the pages of To Kill a Mockingbird on our little bookshelf. It took us hours to find them. Another morning, I could not for the life of me find my phone. We tried calling it, and it would ring, sounding loudly throughout the house, but we couldn't pinpoint the exact spot. Finally, we tracked the ringing to the bathroom, but it sounded like it was coming from behind the wall. The vanity sort of hung there, so I thought, eh, it's probably in the wall seeing how weird everything's been. Maybe there's a hole or something. I took the vanity off its hanging nail, and as soon as I moved it, my phone slid out the back and clattered onto the floor. Derek and I looked at each other, and his face was totally pale. How is that even possible? The haunting got to the point of just being silly. We had a friend come visit, and as soon as she opened the door, my car keys were thrown in her face from across the room. She was like, wait, is the cabin haunted? We kind of joked that, yeah, things get thrown around sometimes and you just have to ignore it. She didn't want to stay there anymore. And that was the point where I asked my landlady if she could provide some history on the cabin we were renting. She got really defensive about it and said she had owned it for years and nothing weird had ever happened there. Long story short, we got evicted a couple of months later. I don't really want to go into it because it doesn't have anything to do with the story. But yeah, the uneasiness persisted until we moved out. Although in the last month of living there, the ghost chilled out on throwing objects at us. I still don't have a concrete explanation for all of the weird things that happened. But I definitely believe in ghosts and other things that we don't understand. I figured I would share my experience living in a 200-year-old cabin that was definitely haunted. So all of these things happened over a span of three years. It started in 2012. A childhood friend from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. 
I needed to get out of my parents and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. It dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family that owned the house. They owned a large portion of the land that's now one of the largest cities in the U.S. Search American Colonial Cabin and you'll see a bunch of images that look just like it. We originally think that it was used as slave quarters, as this was tobacco country, and then later found out that it was a stable house later on. The stable house theory definitely checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have it. The night we moved in, I knew the place had something eerie about it. There were no doors to the upstairs room, my room, and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that somebody had added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout didn't have either. Now that you have a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start the story. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold, and damp, much like a cellar. Par for the course with that type of house, but there was something else. It started with scratching. Every night that I would be in bed, I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough, I realized that the scratching was long and drawn out, like a foot long pull, then repeated. I just covered my head, muffled my ears, and closed my eyes. I was a 23 year old man that felt like I was cowering, but I wasn't about to tussle with wood scratching spirits. Well, one night, I heard the scratching start. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late, and that's when I heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room, and then it went down the wall, and then it scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room and back to the wall, and then gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside logs were the same as the outside. Like I said, it was an old log cabin. There were no spaces anywhere for something to crawl, like when you have insulation and stuff like that. I got scared and I started sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now my wife, asked what was up and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was all in the first week, by the way. Here's the creepiest part. When we moved in, I had to unscrew all of the screws that the previous renter had put into the windows. I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut. We had to clean out weird rabbit food, we think, from the oven. We had to write, doesn't live here, on the hundreds of mail order catalogs that the previous renter received. We always joked that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but now I'm not sure if we're too far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with when somebody was with you. Until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I was watching myself sleep. The entity started to loom over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building up in my head and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprang up from my sleep and I looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off. Just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time it was far too coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I had turned it off myself. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me that nothing really happened in there. 
Maybe because it was an addition, I don't know. Well, our ghost played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid after being married for five years, so that part worked out, I guess. Anyway, once I was upstairs reading, and as I was falling asleep, my window started to open and shut. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit, so the next day I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny that it never does that when I'm not in there. I ended up yelling at it, telling it to leave us alone and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it worked. Kind of, for a while. Then when I was home alone, alarm clocks started going off. As soon as my wife would leave, drawers would open, there would be banging on the front door, and these alarm clocks would go off. Over time, it just stopped, slowed down, and ultimately fizzled into nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Who knows? Today, my in-laws live there. They were my landlords. And the home is cute, homey, and warm. I spend time there alone, and I don't feel any malice. Weird experience. I would do it all over again if I had to, though. Can't argue with results. I'm from California, and way back when, I was on the college search. I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop. So my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old rundown overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees. So my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, Yoo-hoo. 
I kid you not. When I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yoohoo, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though, as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was.